If you're new to my channel, I am reading One Piece for the very first time and I am making it through arc by arc and I'm currently on the Alabaster arc. Oh, this is gonna be dramatic. Oh. <sighs> Why do I get the feeling? Something really bad is gonna happen. I have been feeling slightly bored. I don't know, maybe like streak through the local park. I, I can't believe he's done this. Anyway, yes, we met Ace. I mean, but that is just a gut-wrenching panel that I just watched there. Gut-wrenching. It is tense up in here. There's a lot that is hurting me in this arc. I genuinely hope I don't have anything else that's gonna traumatize me because I just can't be handling that right now. I need a closer spook. I don't think I've ever crushed on a manga character before in all my life like this. Right, I'm just gonna risk copyright to show you this, but this part gave me chills, absolute chills. Hello everyone, welcome or welcome back to How to Train Your Gavin. Today I am bringing you another One Piece video and today and tomorrow actually that I'm filming this, I will be reading a very highly anticipated arc. A few weeks ago, I asked what everyone's favorite Alabaster Saga arc is. A lot of people said the Alabaster arc, which is the final arc in the Alabaster Saga that I need to read. So I have just done Reverse Mountain, Whiskey Peak, Little Garden, and Drum Island. Have you ever played that game with someone where you go around and you say one item and then they say your item and then their item and then the next person says your item, their item, and then their own item and then you have to like go around and you know keep saying the items without forgetting? That's kind of what I want to do with these arcs. I want to see if I could try and remember all of the arcs in order and hopefully by the time I get to the final arc or whatever arc is the most recent that I catch up to, I want to see if I can remember all of the arcs by memory. I feel like that's like a fun little challenge that I want to do that I literally just thought of right now. So we have Romance Dawn, Orange Town, Syrup Village, Barate? Is that the fourth one? Um, Barate, what was after that again? Arlong Park, which is my favourite. The Log Town? I need to put this down. Uh, Reverse Mountain. Whiskey Peak, Little Garden, Drum Island. So that's 10. I have done 10 arcs so far, haven't I? Is that right? Hey, I got it right, I got it right, okay, perfect. So now it's the Alabaster, Alabaster arc. If you're new to my channel, I am reading One Piece for the very first time and I am making it through arc by arc and I'm currently on the Alabaster arc. So please no spoilers after this point. I have no idea what happens after this and I have no idea what happens in this arc right now, but by the time this video goes up, I will have read this whole thing. I'm gonna be reading volume 17 through 24 of One Piece and the Alabaster arc covers chapters 155 to 270. And this is the longest arc I've ever had to review in a single video. I mean, I did do the East Blue Saga in one video and that's 100 chapters, but I didn't go chapter by chapter like I have been doing with the past few arcs. So we're going to see how we're going to do it with this one because there are 63 chapters in this arc and that would mean 64 updates, including this one. So yeah... We're just gonna play by ear. Before I actually continue, I do actually have a, which might be a bit redundant now if you're watching this way in the future, but I am doing a manga tournament, which I will link the video for as well down below if it is up by the time you watch this. I am doing a manga tournament where I am reading the first volumes of eight different manga series that everyone's been recommending to me on my One Piece videos, on my channel, in the community tab. And I want to do like this whole tournament style battle between these eight mangas, but I have 20 amazing recommendations that a lot of people have submitted to me. So I currently have a preliminary round where the top eight from the 20 in that poll will be chosen. So you guys have total control over what is, you know, going to be picked in the manga tournament. And I kind of was inspired by Daniel Green who put out a poll for which manga series to do a deep dive on. So I took the poll inspiration from him, but I don't think anyone's done a manga tournament where they're facing off volumes of each manga to pick which next manga series to read. I don't think. I might be totally wrong if somebody has got a video like that, please link it down below. I would love to watch it. But I do have a link to that poll down below, so please do vote. The more votes, the better. And I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyway, I feel like this video is gonna be like two to three hours long. So let's get into Alabaster. And yeah, I'm so excited. Ash, are you excited? Yeah, you're excited. What I loved about chapter 155 is that it acted as a sort of recap slash reminder of our current goal with the Straw Hats and a little bit like a here's what you missed on Glee kind of recap. And I do think I kind of need it. I mean, I don't need it for the grand scheme of the plot, but I do need it for who's who and who is paired with who because the Broke works, they are agents and each of the men are categorized by number and each of the women are categorized by day of the week or a special day like Mother's Day, Father's Day, things like that. So there is a this really handy panel which I'm very wary about showing panels now even my own copy of it just because of the whole copyright situation that Daniel Green found himself in very recently and now I'm just like hmm even though I'm shown from my own book 
and I'm not putting like a screenshot or a big panel on the screen. It's just like a kind of, he has a little look. I'm still a little bit scared of that. So unless it's absolutely cemented and clear that you can show your own copy of it, like just like briefly and, and stuff, then I will just continue to just talk about the panels and what I love and what I hate and things like that and hope that you know what I mean rather than me flipping it around and showing you. So there is this whole kind of cheat sheet for the Baroque works and I feel like either scanning this and printing it off and so I've got a, a copy of it or just like seeing if I can get the panel online and keep referring to it when I need to. But this did establish more of Crocodile as the villain who is trying to take off Alabaster but at the same time at the same time he's not doing anything that's very villainous right now. If anything he's saving Alabaster from pirates who are kind of terrorizing the residents there whereas the king of Alabaster is a little bit too slow in protecting his people. So it looks like Mr. Crocodile is the one who is the savior of Alabaster. So right now I'm like, hmm, maybe these people do need Crocodile in order to protect them. Like he hasn't done anything that has really made him a villain. He's an antagonist because he is against our Vivi. We're automatically on the side of our straw hats whereas Crocodile opposes that. But at the minute, I'm kind of like, how is he opposing them just yet? I mean, I know how he's like, kind of wants to take over Alabaster, but I mean, at the minute, if the king can't even get there in time and save his people, then, you know? So I don't actually know whose side I'm on right now. <laughs> I'm sure he will do something a lot more evil as we go on, but right now, he hasn't done anything bad to me. You know, you should never judge somebody based on what other people tell you. Honestly, you should always form your own opinions. And this is true in real life. Don't judge someone just based on other people's opinion of them. At the minute, I don't have a bad opinion on Crocodile. Even though he is the ultimate Baroque Works agent and he's the one controlling everyone, I'm still like, but he's saving these people in Alabaster right now. And I know it's for the purpose of taking over. He's not doing, anyway, I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted. We only got little touches of the straw hats. We had Luffy eat pretty much all of the food, not all of the food though, pretty much all of the food that Sanji had collected to keep them, you know, going until Alabaster. And then there was a panel of Usopp, Chopper, and Kuro as well. There was a panel of them equally guilty in the eating in of the food. <laughs> the eating in. I don't know if that's a word, but that was a funny little moment. And the only moment with the straw hats in this, essentially. But we're off to a good start, and that means that I get to start volume 80 now, so I already feel like I've achieved so much by finishing a volume, by reading one chapter, and on to the next. I love how Luffy, Usopp, and Chopper are portrayed as the idiots of the group. <laughs> it was funny at first because Luffy had attached Karu to his fishing rod so that they could try and catch some fish, and they end up catching Mr. Two, who is Bonclay, and like that whole exchange was like so random and so hilarious, but I do think it's gonna be important because what Mr. Two does is extremely terrifying because one of the things that kind of scares me, like one of my biggest fears, is that somebody will take my appearance and look like me and do something like to either my family or to people I love or just to anyone and get me in like the biggest trouble ever. Like that is one of my biggest fears, which is a very unfounded fear in all honesty, because that could never happen, right? Well, One Piece just showed that it can. Because I obviously take One Piece as fact, right? So now I'm worried that Mr. Two Bon Clay or anyone who's ate the clone clone fruit will take my appearance and, I don't know, maybe like streak through the local park? Things like that really do keep me up at night. So I really do feel like Mr. Two is going to be quite a formidable villain because now he has all of their faces. Pretty much, I think he got everyone's face and he can now go around as Luffy if he wanted to or anyone. Like, he could get them into serious trouble and then they won't know who to trust as well. Like, what if he changes into one of them with the other people there? And then they're like, well, which one's the real Luffy? You know, or, or things like that. Like, that is like a, a scary thing for me. Like I am actually genuinely scared about stuff like that. Sorry, I'm distracted by the guy on the front of this volume who's shirtless. I think that's Ace because we met him briefly in Drum Island and yeah. There was a really nice world building moment as well when they come across some steam and Nami tells them that there are volcanoes under the, the, the ocean. I forgot the word for it there. And she says something like, in thousands of years, it will become a new island. And I just love that. I love that. I love how we have this method of transportation across the ocean that allows little glimpses into the world that isn't too distracting. It's just like little nuggets that are placed every now and then. 
in. That was a really nice moment too. I enjoyed that. But yes, very scared about Mr. Two's powers. Very scared about the fact that we're heading directly to Crocodile because I do think that even though I don't see him as a villain, just an antagonist, and thank you so much to the person who was in my comments a few videos back who was talking to me about, you know, like the difference between a villain and an antagonist, and I kind of seeing how those roles fit into One Piece. So thank you for that discussion. It really actually did open my eyes to a lot of what villains slash antagonists do. And yeah, I think so far, Crocodile is an antagonist, not a villain. Excited to see what he ends up doing. Yeah, there's a lot of impending dread with this storyline. You know what, it is very interesting to see more of Luffy's family life, I guess. I feel like I should have known this, but I didn't. Anyway, yes, we met Ace. I mean, I mean, I like his design. I do, I like his design a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a bit of a family resemblance to Luffy because apparently he is the older brother of Luffy as revealed by the end of this chapter. Looking for my kid brother, he says. Podcast D Ace. And again, I wanna know what this D stands for, but is it the only day I wanna find out about? And for a moment, it looked like he had died. Like he just randomly died, but no, he just keeps falling asleep. <laughs> he just falls asleep randomly, even with a mouthful of food, even in the middle of conversation, he'll just like, Pfft, asleep. And honestly, I envy that. I envy that a lot. I can probably stop this now because I'm not in heat anymore. But what a great introduction to Ace. I mean, I know we briefly saw him in the previous arc, but this was more like a, a personality thing. And then we do get that whole revelation looking for my kid brother. So his goal, his intention is laid bare. Whether or not he has been completely honest with what he's doing in Alabasta is up in the air. Like, I don't know if I fully trust any new characters when they are introduced, especially since I still have some trust issues after the Vivi reveal, after she was originally an antagonist and then became Princess Vivi. Like, I feel like I can't rush to judgment with a lot of these new characters. However, I do really like his design. So I'm inclined to take him at face value or add value, you know, whichever one you are looking at. And Believe what this guy says. Innocent until proven guilty. The Straw Hats still haven't arrived at Alabaster. There was this big sea cat, sea monster. It is a sacred animal in Alabaster, so they can't eat it. Honestly, they're getting me so hungry now. Not for sea cat or sea monster or anything like that. But yeah, just the talk of food and saying how starving they are because they haven't eaten in like four days. It's making me very hungry. And I'm also thirsty for obvious reasons. We have finally landed in Alabasta and so far it's looking like a pretty interesting place. And it was cool to see a couple of returning characters, Smoker and Tashigi. Especially since there was a really interesting thing between Tashigi and Zoro in Logtown or Logtown. Logtown? I think it's Logtown because it's supposed to be Prologtown, right? So Prolog, Log, Logtown. But yeah, there was an interesting thing between them two because Tashigi reminded Zoro of, I think her name was Kiyuna or the young friend that he had when he was a kid and promised to one day fight in order to become the greatest swordsman in the world but unfortunately Kiyuna had died. Then Tashigi comes into the Logtown arc and reminds Zoro of her. So I want to know more about that. I am so intrigued by that so I'm really glad that Tashigi is back and Smoker as well. Smoker is quite a I mean, he's one of the Marines, so I don't <laughs> automatically like him, but he is very determined. But he's, he's found Luffy, because Luffy, he can't control himself. He's starving, right? So he runs to the same restaurant that Ace is in, causes massive chaos and damage, and doesn't pay for his food, and ends up getting into a scrape with Smoker. So yeah, now Luffy's run away and <laughs> ran towards his team, his straw hat team, and they're like, don't run this way, you idiot. <laughs> and then Ace has come out of nowhere and has saved Luffy, and Luffy knows Ace, so Ace isn't lying about who he is, right? At least I don't think so. He's still, I think, his brother, his big brother. <sighs> I need a closer spook. I don't think I've ever crushed on a manga character before in all my life like this. It's all cool as well because when Ace steps between Smoker and Luffy, Ace says to Smoker, you might be smoke but I'm fire. So I think Ace has some kind of like fire powers? It explains so much. It explains why he's shirtless for one. Why so bloody hot for the other? Honestly, my mouth is getting drier than the alabaster desert. I'm gonna go grab a drink and continue reading volume 18. Wait, is Ace gone already? No. No, I wanted him to stick around longer. We did actually find out a few chapters before that he's Whitebeard's commander. Whitebeard's second division commander. And he does actually ask Luffy if he wants to join Whitebeard's team. I don't think we've actually heard of Whitebeard so far. We've definitely heard of Blackbeard. But I don't think Whitebeard has been mentioned. But it's interesting as well because Ace offered Luffy to join his team, to join Whitebeard's team. And Luffy obviously politely declines. And Ace is also going to help 
Whitebeard get the One Piece. So he's saying, one day we're going to fight Luffy. I'm a little bit scared of that because it does look like Ace is very strong. And even Luffy says that they both had the devil fruit, but even when Luffy was the only one who had had it, he still couldn't beat Ace. So Ace, as a normal person, could still beat someone who had already eaten the devil fruit. So, oh, Ace. And he sounds like such a good big brother as well. The way he was like to the Straw Hats, make sure you look after him. He's probably a handful, but yeah, please look after him. I'm just like, oh. Oh, I love it when family members care for one another. Essentially, I just love everything that Ace does. I feel like I'm Sanji, but for Ace. Oh, also, I need to show you guys. I went to Forbidden Planet recently so I could buy loads of first volume mangas for my manga tournament idea. And I ended up seeing these two in the three for two offer. So I got these two in something else. I haven't read the backs of them, though. I do not want any spoilers. But I saw One Piece and I didn't have them, so I bought them. <laughs> these are light novels and these are Ace's story. I'm sure you guys already know what these are. But yeah, I don't know when I'm supposed to read them. Like, am I supposed to wait until I'm caught up with the series, the One Piece series, before reading this? Or can I read this after the Alabasta saga? What should I do? What should I do? I'm too scared to read the blurb. Too scared to read the blurb on the back. Unless this is a kind of prequel, you know, it is Ace's story. Maybe this is how he joined Whitebeard? potentially. But I'm really excited to read these. Just don't know when I'm supposed to. Anyway, back to volume 18. What else happened? Oh my god, yes. So number 11 was murdered by other Baroque Works members by the Billions. Like they are essentially a group of the Baroque Works who, I'm probably going to mess this summary up, are the Officer Agents Underlings. There are apparently 200 agents considered the Billions and there are millions as well. 1,800 agents. Frontier Agents Underlings. So the Billions are quite high up, I think. I'm still trying to work my head around the Baroque Works model. But yeah, the chapter started with the murder of Mr. Eleven by some Billions agents, because now they'll be like, oh, there's an opening to be one of the high numbers. So yeah, even the Baroque Works are turning against each other, but that's good for our team, but also bad. Also bad because if they can murder one another, then what's stopping them from murdering their enemies, you know? Seems like a lot of these Baroque works, people are out for themselves. But we shall see, we shall see. Mr. 3 is also apparently somewhere too. So I do think because this is the last one in the Alabaster saga, we might have a conclusion with the Baroque works in this saga. I don't know. So this arc might be the be all end all for the Baroque works. We still have a long way to go. <laughs> a strange chapter indeed and I already miss Ace. It's cool to see that the Baroque works agents are kind of coming together and I think they're about to meet Mr. Zero, aka Crocodile, and they're gearing up for some kind of showdown or some kind of plan that's happening in two days' time, which Crocodile and Miss All Sunday talk about. And I want to see more of Miss All Sunday. I really like her. And I don't know why I'm gravitating towards her. I feel like she's just so nonchalant and she's just there. <laughs> I feel like she's there, but not quite there, you know? I don't know. She has a certain more likability to the other agents that we've been introduced to. We have met Mr. One, who again has a... I love the designs of the Baroque Works agents, don't get me wrong. They are so unique and so different. Mr. One, Miss Doublefinger... Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas. <laughs> when she started to say ho 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 Merry Christmas, I genuinely thought that maybe we were on Christmas time in this arc. And it's very apt because we do have Christmas just around the corner, less than a month away as a film in this video. So yeah, the Baroque Works are meeting at this spider cafe. The agents have kind of booked the cafe out for the night in order to talk through their plans. I don't know what their meeting is going to be about. I think maybe that's what the next chapter might delve into. I like how Mr. Two's introduction into this cafe is a little bit different to the others as well. He kind of like dances in with some of the Billions members and it kind of reminds me of the Django cover titles, cover covers, uh, where Django is pretty much dancing throughout the entire world. And he is still going actually at the start of the next chapter, Django's Dance Paradise Volume 27, Shall We Dance. Why do I feel like there's going to be some kind of showdown between Django and Mr. Two? Because they're both great dancers and I kind of want to dance off. I really would like a dance off between those two characters. And I haven't talked a single thing about the Straw Hats. That's because they're gearing up to meet the kind of rebel camp and they're going to Yuba, I think it's pronounced. Yuba. And yeah, hopefully things go well. Vivi is hoping that she can just talk to the rebels and get them to... I guess, not rebel against Alabaster or the King of Alabaster, essentially her family. She does want to avoid bloodshed, but I think that's exactly where we're heading. I don't think this is going to be something that she can talk through. So I love her 
positivity. But realistically, she's gonna have to lower her expectations because people are gonna die, I think. I think people are gonna die. And at the end of the previous chapter, Ace had given Luffy like this blank piece of paper and he says that should he ever need to find him, he'll be able to. And it's a little bit strange, it's a little bit strange. But with this being such a magical and adventurous world, I imagine it reveals some kind of secret or, I don't know, it has some kind of hidden power. And Luffy has got it stitched into his straw hat. And at first I was like, hmm, maybe that's not the safest place to put it because he could lose that straw hat. But then I remember just how important that straw hat is to Luffy and how much he still has that promise to Shanks. And I think probably the hat is the safest place to put it because no matter what, Luffy is going to have that hat with him until he becomes King of the Pirates, which is why I think he promised Shanks, he promised him that he would give it back once he's become the ultimate pirate. I want to say yes again, so I really hope Luffy doesn't lose the hat or the piece of paper. Oh, I'm freezing. I wish I was in Alabasta right now. Seeing how beautiful Alabasta is, I mean, Alabasta is dried up, so it's not that beautiful that I can see, but like the illustration of it and seeing the different places too that they're going through and to hear kind of Vivi's history on Alabaster 2 in like the different cities. It's like so engrossing and I love seeing the illustrations of it. Like there's just so much potential in this region that I can't wait to see it restored back to its former glory. Like I'm invested in Alabaster getting back on its feet and I am learning more about what Crocodile has done to Alabaster and there's quite a lot of focus on dance and there is, well, there was something called the dance powder that made artificial rain, which Crocodile kind of manipulated the king to have. And the artificial rain steals from the neighbouring places so that when the palace, when the king had the artificial rain and the people of Alabasta lost faith in him because it seemed like he was stealing the rain from the other places. So Crocodile like really manipulated that. So I am starting to see more of what he's done that is a really bad thing for this place. So he is essentially causing trouble and then saving the people to make them trust him more. And it's a very smart and manipulative thing for him to do. This chapter was mainly just the straw hats they've docked and they're going towards Yuba. And there were these really cute Kung Fu Jugon, Jugon, things they look like little seals and they're so cute like the way that one of them is like this and whenever a kung fu jugon defeats someone that jugon becomes an apprentice to the person they beat up so they did end up beating up Usopp <laughs> very easily I might add but unfortunately our team can't take them with them because Vivi said that you can't have that many that would be allowed into the cities so that's a bit of a shame, but they are cute. I hope they come back. Anyway, back to the dance thing, because I totally went off on a tangent there, didn't I? Back to the dance thing. We had Mr. Two in his dancing. We have Django in his dancing. Then we also have the dancing powder, the dance powder even. And yeah, that focus on dance is so interesting. I feel like that's going to be important or not. We end the chapter with Luffy saying, I'm ready for action. And same. Same. I do like this whole slow build of the world though because we have had little different creatures kind of introduced. We've had each city talked about at least, or at least some of them. I believe there's way more cities in Alabasta that haven't been discussed yet, but we are getting so many different glimpses into Alabasta that's really building this place up from the ground up. And now I am ready for some action. I feel like I got a taste of it with Ace. I did, but we didn't really get to see a whole lot of fighting or anything like that. Not that I'm only interested in fighting, because I'm not. But I am excited for some of the action to start. I'm with Luffy on this one. I just ate some crisps, so I apologise if there's crisps all over my face. Or chips, if you're in America. Chapter 162 is essentially just going through the desert. So not a whole lot to say about it. There was some action though. We did come across this big sand dragon thing and they end up killing it. Well, Luffy ends up killing it quite quickly. And they are that desperate for food that Luffy would attack a dragon for it. Although it was funny before that as well because, and again, love this kind of detail too. There were these birds that would pretend to be dead. And then when Luffy was like trying to help, the birds ended up stealing all of their supplies. So those are evil, evil birds. They're probably worse than the Baroque works. Little bastards. It's funny as well to see this desert set and push our friends to the limit and the friendship between them as well is being stretched very thin. There's a lot of infighting. There's a lot of shouting at one another. There's a lot of things that Luffy does that's so frustrating. Like he takes this huge mouthful of water when he was only supposed to take a little bit just to wet his lips and spitting it out, getting the food taken away from them and so much more that he's done this arc so far. That has just not gone well for 
our heroes. So honestly, Luffy would be one of the worst people to be in this situation with. So I really do admire the patience that everyone has with him at the minute. It's hilarious. There is this cute camel as well that we've just been introduced to too that Nami has called eyelashes. Eyelashes will only carry women. So Nami and Vivi are going to be getting taken along and hopefully it will make them get to the place they need to get to much quicker because the quicker they get there, the quicker I can get to hopefully more of the crux of the story that this arc is supposed to give you. But it does feel realistic, the fact that they are traveling this desert. Like they are in agony. They feel bored. They feel tired, thirsty, hungry. And I can really feel that through the illustrations. So yeah, I, even though it has gotten a bit slower, I genuinely don't mind. I do want the action, don't get me wrong, I want the action. And there is little bits here and there, especially like with the dragon and the birds that steal their food. But yeah, it'll be cool to see them get to Yuba and interact with a whole lot of other characters. And hopefully Ace comes back. Oh my god, I should really save this for the next chapter because it's the title page for chapter 164. Django, he got caught by the Navy and the headquarters trial verdict is death by hanging. That can't be, Django can't get hung hanged hopefully he escapes in the next Django stands paradise please let him escape i mean i didn't realize like how much i would end up liking Django through the cover stories i really do enjoy the little side stories and things so i didn't realize that there was some black pages here i just totally just went in blind with this volume and we all know what happens when there are a bunch of black pages together don't we backstory flashback heartbreak. So I don't know actually what happens next with this flashback, but it's probably going to be sad. So let me explain. We have come to Yuba, where all the rebels were supposed to be. However, we meet an old man called Toto. I think it's Toto. And Vivi can't believe it because she knows him although she didn't quite recognize him at first vivi is terrible at recognizing people quite honestly like she should have recognized mr two when he got on the straw hat ship like even though she'd never met him she knew of him and what he was supposed to look like and the stuff he was wearing and she never figured that out in time and it's the same thing with toto like vivi must have the worst memory of anyone ever or like she's just like very slow at regaining her awareness of the people around her i don't know yes the rebels have actually moved on they don't live in yuba anymore they have moved to kataria which is an oasis near nanohana which is exactly where they were before so they've gone all this way for well it seems like no reason but i feel like it will have been an important journey for them i think there will still be something probably this heartbreaking backstory that will be vital to the Straw Hats and their fight against the Baroque Works, potentially the fight against the Rebels. I don't know if they're actually going to fight, but something tells me there will be a fight. So it sounds like it might be a wasted journey, but I don't think it is. So the flashback, the, the backstory is Vivi as a child. There is a young boy called Koza, who is Toto's son, and he has caused some trouble. He's before the king, and Koza is saying about how the villagers are suffering and things, so the king wants to cut some finances towards the palace so that that money can kind of stem into the peasants of Alabasta and hopefully help them. And Vivi is, uh, well, she ends up becoming a friend to Koza, and there is like some fight between them and she's like his second in command and stuff. And at the end of this chapter, there are a couple of people who are after Vivi and Koza tells her to run. And since Toto is by himself, since Toto was by himself, in Yuba, something's going to happen to Koza. Something heartbreaking is going to happen to Koza. I just know it. I just know it. I don't know if I'm ready. Chapter 164, I love my country. Why do I get the feeling? Something really bad is going to happen. Yet, yeah, not going to lie, I genuinely thought Koza was going to die. There was a really scary moment where, as a kid, Koza and Vivi were being chased by these thugs. And it was the San San band that were trying to defend Vivi. And Koza was like so adamant that they protect her and they would die for her. And I genuinely thought that he would get killed because he does actually get cut in the face. And it looked almost like he was going to die. But he's actually the leader of the rebels. Koza is actually the leader of the rebels. Let that sink in. I literally met Koza in, like, in the last chapter. Literally. The previous chapter I've just read... That's two chapters I've known him. 
And I, I can't believe he's done this. I can't believe he's done this. I can say why, though. I feel the desperation for the people. I feel like there's been so much time that's passed and so many failed promises made by the king, potentially. And the people are just sick of it. They need their city back. They need their town back or their country back. And it's just not going to plan. So they have the right heart, I think. It's just their way of going about being rebels seems to be counterintuitive of our main character's goals, which relates to Vivi and helping Vivi and getting Alabaster back on track. I just still can't get over Corsa being the leader of the rebels. I've known this man for two chapters and I am already so invested in his story. Like, is he going to change his mind by the end? Is he going to say Vivi and want to help? What is going on? Vivi also doesn't want her friends to die for her. I feel like this is something that she's still carrying over into her adulthood. So the friends that she made with the San San Band was so touching. It hasn't lasted that long or we haven't seen a whole lot of it. But it was still very touching that they would have been so defensive of her and protective of her. And seeing that is just like another beautiful friendship within the One Piece world. This series is the best at representing friendship. Definitely think the friendships in here are some of the best that I've ever read in anything ever. But now I'm just so heartbroken that Kosa is the leader of the rebels. Like, this isn't going to be easy. <laughs> We've got some drama ahead of us. We better not be getting another Luffy versus Zoro situation here. Because the next chapter is called Luffy versus Vivi. And he does something at the end of this chapter that's just so... What? <laughs> he just suddenly stops and says that he quits. And I feel like Luffy versus Vivi means that Vivi will fight him because he's given up. But I don't understand why Luffy would do that. So I need to read on and find out. Anyway, jumping ahead. This chapter was so pivotal because we find out the ultimate goal of Brokeworks. The agents that are here in Rain Base, the City of Dreams. Rain Dinner's Casino. It reminds me a little bit of Nino Kuni, which is a game I played years and years and years ago that I absolutely love, by the way. I love Nino Kuni so much. And it seems like maybe Nino Kuni took some inspiration from One Piece. <laughs> like, every single thing that I've ever mentioned has been an inspiration from One Piece. But yeah, this is the first time that Mr. Zero has revealed himself to be Crocodile to the others. So now they know that one of the seven pirate warlords is their boss, essentially. And they had no idea it would be a pirate. The ultimate goal is Operation Utopia, where they want Alabaster to disappear how, I do not know, but then they will get the residents of Alabaster, who will have nowhere else to run, to go to them. They want to get this huge, strong military might. They are just essentially trying to build their numbers up so much that no force will be able to stop them. And that is a great plan. That is a great plan, if it works, of course. But the fact that they want the entire city, the entire island of Alabaster to disappear, it will be a challenge. It'll be interesting to see if they actually do it. So there are the rebels who are the problem. We have Baroque works who are the problem. There's just a lot of stuff going on in the minute. And now apparently Luffy's the problem because apparently he quits. I'm scared to read the next chapter. I don't want to be another Luffy versus Zoro situation. I really don't. This isn't another case of Luffy acting out character. Okay, fortunately it wasn't like Luffy versus Zoro because that would have pissed me off if it had of. I mean, it still feels a little random, but at the same time, Luffy does say a lot of things that we were thinking. Because I believe I did mention a couple of times earlier on in this vlog that Vivi wanting no bloodshed, no fighting with this confrontation with the rebels is rather naive. We love her positive outlook on it, but we all know where it's headed. And that's exactly what Luffy says. He does go about it in a rather dramatic kind of fashion by just stopping and saying he quits. Like he could literally just say what he was thinking. However, this is Luffy, so he is unpredictable. He is his own thing. So I can't really fault him too much for that. But yeah, it didn't feel like Luffy versus Zoro, so that's fine. And it didn't last that long. It did have Luffy making a whole lot of sense about, let's go after Crocodile. He's the one who is causing all the trouble. And if they go to the rebels, then they're not really going to be able to solve much. So Luffy just wants to punch Crocodile in the face. And that's what we want to. I want to see that happen. And especially since Mr. 3 came back, and I believe he was, like, very briefly in the distance in a prior chapter, 
but I wasn't 100% sure. It was very discreet, but we did actually have Mr. Three come into this meeting that he wasn't invited to because he was supposed to have been taken care of by Mr. Two. And we had that conversation between Crocodile and Mr. Three where Crocodile mentions the whole talk on the telephone or snail phone or whatever it was, where he actually talked to Sanji and not Mr. Three. But obviously Crocodile didn't know that, so he thought that the Straw Hats and Vivi were taken care of long ago. He thought they were gone. He thought their plan was going to go ahead without any interference from them. But now that Mr. Three has revealed to him that they are fine, they realise that they must be in Alabaster. So now they also have Crocodile and the cronies out for them. So that's very exciting. Again, we are gearing up and up and up. Every single chapter I've read now is just turning that dial up just a smidge. We're getting closer and closer to this big epic confrontation that I just feel in my bones is going to happen. Crocodile's powers as well looks extremely terrifying. He puts his hand around Mr. Three's throat and he dries up and then he gets thrown down a chute where he is underwater-ish. Like there is like this glass dome around him and there are these sea creatures, banana gators, that are around. So Mr. Three is in trouble. He didn't die just yet and also we have images of the straw hats that Crocodile has. Apart from Sanji, they don't have Sanji's image and Chopper, because I think they mistakenly think Chopper is their pet, which honestly goes in Chopper's favour. They will not see him coming, hopefully, and Sanji, hopefully. That is volume 18 done, and now we're on to volume 19. Well, I'm very glad that Django isn't going to die from hanging anymore. He is being acquitted after a sort of dance party in the courtroom. I love how we have this huge alabaster battle coming up, and we are given these little sprinklings of... A lighter storyline with Django, so I love it though, I love it. I feel like only Order can do something like that and still make it feel like a natural thing. I also love how Order does also kind of spell things out for us in that the end of the chapter has what each kind of, what would you call it? Each of the groups of people? Are going to be doing. So we do have the rebels plan to attack the royal army at Alubana, which is the capital of Alabaster and where the, the king lives. But the king and the royal army are going to attack Crocodile at Rain Base, and so are these straw hats. So there's going to be a lot of moving around and a lot of chess pieces falling into place. Yeah, essentially not a whole lot to say about this chapter. We are just gearing up for what's to come. But also I don't like not updating with the chapter but also I need to have this thing where I talk about each chapter at least a little bit just so that my own kind of compulsion is scratched you know like that itch to have every single chapter listed in the timestamps it is scratched I don't think I can do a bulk review of chapters just because yeah I like to have one by one by one but this is the main problem I will work on that the only thing of note really in this chapter for me personally is that Zoro and Tashiki finally come face to face again since Logtown and the fact that Zoro will not fight her he runs away and it's not often we see Zoro run away from a fight so I I need more of them two interacting so I can really get more of a sense of their dynamic and I understand some of the reasons why Zoro wants to run away from a fight with Tashiki but at the same time I'm a bit like I need resolution. I need to know what is actually going on with these two. And we also did have a funny moment where Luffy and Usopp run into a place that sells water and Captain Smoker and Tashiki are at the bar and they are just minding their own business, just chatting, when Luffy and Usopp just kind of fall into their hands, essentially, which is totally typical of them. And then having them both squirt water into their faces. Oh, amazing comedic timing. I honestly can't wait for my housemate to move out at the end of this week so that I can actually do better updates than this. Other than that though, this was a chapter that was pivotal because we had the Straw Hats come face to face with Crocodile. And they are in this like little prison, this cage thing that is made of sea stones so that Devil Fruit powers have no power in that little prison thing. So they're a bit screwed at the minute. Whether Vivi is out fighting for her life, she is face to face with Miss All Sunday. And we also have Sanji and Chopper kind of MIA at the minute. So I have a feeling that Chopper and Sanji will have to save the Straw Hats very soon. Smoker is also trapped. So I wonder if Smoker and the Straw Hats will end up teaming together to take down Crocodile. It wouldn't surprise me if that happened. And I'm hoping Miss All Sunday might also betray Crocodile. She is too good to be his partner. Luffy, that was a clever trap. 
I mean, it really wasn't. <laughs> the fact that they were escorted to it after they ran into the casino shouting crocodile. I mean, it's not really that smart trap. They were literally led there. Still it is. I'm sure they will and have a plan. I'm sure they have a plan. They did have a plan that we weren't privy to earlier on. They seem to have some kind of thing. I mean, at least I hope they do. <laughs> a lot of the times they do wing it, but I think they do have a plan. It was made to be a little bit vague that we aren't supposed to know what the plan is. I just hope they pull it off, or I might be totally wrong, and they have zero plan. Right, not a whole lot to say about this chapter. I want to go straight on to the next one, because it ends with the fact that it's seven o'clock now, and it is time for Operation Utopia to begin. Whew, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm ready for it, because I have been feeling slightly bored. Not exactly bored bored, because I don't think I could ever be bored with One Piece. Yeah, I'm just, I'm reading these chapters just waiting for a big thing to happen essentially and it has been building up it has been building up and the the suspense the tension is high like this is what is supposed to happen this is what's supposed to happen we're supposed to wait and wait and wait and wait until it finally happens and it's going to happen i hope i think whatever the plan actually entails i know it's to wipe out alabasta but like how? I want to know the ins and outs of it. I want to know what actually happens. A couple of things. Miss All Sunday has had a devil fruit. Now she can sprout limbs. Rather freaky looking, not gonna lie. It is a little bit disgusting. One of the most disgusting devil fruits that I've ever seen. Crocodile has also had a devil fruit and he essentially turns into sand. Vivi attacks him and it looks like he's been like beheaded, but it turns out he just like turned into sand. What was the was it like the sand sand fruit? So he's essentially a sand man. It's again another freaky weird devil fruit power that is handy but it's looking like we are in deep shit right now and my moment of the chapter is when luffy pretends to be sanji hey who ate all the meat while he's imprisoned i mean what else are you gonna do i knew as soon as the king heard that young boy that the king would be mr two i don't think it's like that much of a surprise to like anyone reading but again it goes back to what i said before about mr two and how his powers are so scary because if he can you know make his face or his appearance appear as somebody else it's just gonna put them in so much trouble. Like he could kill somebody as the king and they would think it was the king. He could kill somebody as Luffy and they would think it was Luffy, you know? So the king is gone and Mr. Two has made himself look like him and has confronted the rebels or at least the people who are in the city and says, oh, I stole the rain and has a little tiffle with Koza and Koza gets shot. And it looks very serious. A lot of the injuries in the One Piece series looks very serious and turns out to just be but a scratch. Tis but a scratch. So I believe Corsa will be absolutely fine, but the operation is in full swing. We have the other operatives in the Baroque works, it's just swanning in. I kind of love the pairing of Mr. One and Miss Doublefinger. There's something about them. They seem just rather calm, but also really scary looking. Don't get me wrong, they will F you up, but they'll sit down and have a coffee after the BUS. I think my favourite part of this chapter was the actual cover story and seeing Django join the Marines. Yeah, that was a turn of events nobody really expected, at least I didn't expect. And also I think we saw Kobe as well in the background of that. He was walking away, he was on the side, so it might not have been him, but he does look a little bit different. And I think Helmepo as well was with him. But all hell is breaking loose essentially in Anohana. People are very much against the king now. I think it was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Is that the saying? In order for the people of Alabaster to revolt against the king. Even though there have been a lot of people a lot of times saying, oh, you know, we still believe in the king. We still think he's going to do the best thing for us. I think now that Mr. Two has pretended to be the king and hurt a few people and said that he stole the reign, I feel like that has been what has kind of wiped out some of the remnants of any loyalty to the king. I mean, there might still be some left, especially who we haven't seen in a while, Toto. I hope we get back to him. I hope when we get back to him, he'll still be the one that will ground everyone and anchor everyone and be like, look, obviously the king would not do this. There's something else going on here and hopefully help people see that what they're doing is silly. All this revolting is detracting from the actual enemy. So I really do like how manipulative and cruel and vindictive Crocodile is because he has also just thrown the key to the cage that the Straw Hats are in 
down into the place where he also threw Mr. Three down. So Vivi will have to go after it and get it in order to save the Straw Hats. But I don't think Crocodile will let that happen that easily. I am enjoying it again. Like I was getting a little bit like, hmm, I'm a little bit unsure. I'm not really sure about politics of places. And it feels a little bit heavy in the politics of Alabaster. But it is still interesting, still very good. I just love how the Baroque works are just causing so much chaos. I feel like I should join them. I also love causing chaos. There's a huge part of me that wants Vivi to kick Crocodile's ass because he is very cocky and confident that he will get away with what he's doing. He's making Vivi feel powerless and that kind of antagonist is very infuriating, but like, I love it. Like, what he's doing is awful. He's making Vivi pick between the Straw Hats and, well, the entire country of Alabaster. And she's caught between a rock and a hard place because she doesn't know what to do and she can't really save the Straw Hats just by herself because of the fact that a crocodile, or at least like one of the banana gators, has ate the key. And how's Vivi supposed to get it from inside of them? All hope is not lost though, because this chapter does end with a call from Sa I, I think it's Sanji, because it reminds me of the phone call that happened between Sanji and Crocodile on, I think it was a Little Garden. So all hope is not yet lost because we still have Sanji and Chopper who will hopefully come and help Vivi out. But we will see if it is actually Sanji who calls at the end. Oh, also, the room is flooding, by the way. In one hour, the entire room will be flooded and the Straw Hats will die. And it'll probably be around about eight hours for the rebels to catch up with the king and cause absolute carnage. So there's a lot going on. A lot going on in the minute. So show me the way, princess. Ah! Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay, we have Sanji back and he is calling himself the prince because he's actually smart. He's one of the smart characters in this. He does have his silly moments, of course, but he has a few functioning brain cells. So yeah, he has told Crocodile he is prince, Mr. Prince, and it goes back to an earlier chapter where he pretty much says he is Prince Charming. So it totally fits with the Sanji character and I just love the way the chapter ended with Sanji and Vivi. Vivi run into him and Sanji saying that Chopper is leading Crocodile on a wild goose chase. So their plan, I think they have a plan, is working. They are hopefully going to save the Straw Hats that are still in the cage, hopefully in the next chapter or so, because they have not that much longer to go. Although I feel like it's going to take until the very last possible minute for them to be saved, which is fine by me as long as they're saved. Sanji has also helped Pell the Falcon stop a lot of the millions Baroque work agents. There's not actually a million of them. So they're just called millions because they're just underlings essentially. And I never mentioned Pell the Falcon before, but Pell the Falcon is on the good side, the side of good. And he did help with a little bit of fighting earlier on, but he was like very like in and out. I didn't really get a really good introduction to him. I didn't really get to see too much of what he does. I'm interested to find out more about him, honestly. I wouldn't mind some backstory there. Okay, I'm a little confused. Although, hang on, I'm, firstly, I'm loving this chapter again. Like, I love when Sanji came back and whipped some table manners into those banana gators. Also, I absolutely love Sanji in glasses. Like, he looks so good in glasses. It's ridiculous. Anyway, Vivi does get him and to come back. Chopper distracted Crocodile, led him on a wild goose chase, and that was a really fun, exciting moment. And also having all the water rushing in, and Sanji, you know, beating the Croc's asses, and then also, like, the fact that Crocodile said that the key that he dropped down wasn't actually the real key, okay? And at the time, I was like, oh my god, oh my god, that's terrible. And then right after, we see Crocodile and Missile Sunday come into the room to say all the crocs have been knocked out, the cage is open, the straw hats and smoke are gone. I'm just like, how? If that key didn't work, or it wasn't really the right key, then how how have they escaped? Like, that's interest. How? <laughs> I'm so confused. But also, I'm so glad they're finding out. I really am. And I love Mr. Prince. See you later, Crab Gator. Oh, yes. Like, just when it seems like the straw hats were down on their luck, and it looked like they were losing, they quickly change it around, and now they're in the lead. They're in the lead, they're winning against Croc at the minute, at the minute. But all I wanted to say about this chapter was just that I absolutely adored Sanji. Like, this was Sanji's time to shine. Like, his leg is incredible. Like, he has good leg. He has a very good leg. Is this gonna be a video of me thirsting over all of the One Piece characters? Like, this needs to stop. Okay, it makes sense that Mr. Three would save himself by encasing him in a ball of wax, 
as he was ate by one of those banana gators. So that all makes sense. For a minute, a hot minute, I thought maybe Miss Whole Sunday had betrayed Zero slash Crocodile because I thought maybe she switched the fake key for the real key so that Crocodile thought he had the fake key when he threw it down into the banana gator pit. And so when they came back and they saw that they had escaped, it was because they actually had the real key, even though Crocodile said it was the fake key. Anyway, that was more convoluted than what actually happened. And I was actually kind of glad to say Mr. Three had survived. It made sense that he would use his powers to encase himself, which is something that Crocodile underestimated in him. I feel like Crocodile has underestimated a lot of people so far. And I think maybe in the next chapter, there might be some kind of showdown with Luffy and Crocodile and Vivi, because at the end of the chapter, they're escaping and Chopper has this huge crab a huge crab that is Eyelash's friend. Oh, I just love Eyelash's name. And so they're on their way to the king to help out with the rebellion. So a few things to note about this chapter actually. One is the fact that Luffy commanded Zoro to save Smoker when he could have let him die, he could have let him drown. And that would have probably solved a lot of issues further down the line since Smoker is against the pirates just because of his job essentially. I do feel like Smoker could be a great ally to the Straw Hats and he potentially could in the future maybe because now Smoker has let them go and that's kind of his way of repaying Luffy for commanding Zoro to save his life. So that was really good and it does go back to like say on Drum Island when Luffy doesn't kill the weird killer rabbits. Uh, I can't remember what they were called but he does end up sort of saving them and in turn they save him. So again it's that idea of doing a good deed and having that come back as good karma. Another moment I loved as well is when the gang are all out from the cage when they were about to die from the banana gators and Luffy ends up like knocking some of them out and Luffy and I think it's Mr. Three? I, I think it is because obviously both of them have had devil fruit and Vivi says and I couldn't even handle one of them and Usopp's like, it's okay, those two aren't normal. Just hilarious. I like that bit, okay? So I finished volume 19. Now we're on to volume 20, which has this nice gold foil on it. I like that. So Mrs. All Sunday's name is actually Nico Robin. I don't know what that means. I don't know if I'm supposed to know what that means. But yeah, Nico Robin. I think I pronounced that right. And I feel like the Alabaster arc is gonna give us so much more to her backstory and we're gonna learn so much more about her too. It just seems like there's a lot of focus on her at the minute. And I really wanted to find out more about her, honestly, for however many arcs she's been in now. Ever since we first got introduced to her, she's always kind of piqued my interest. The fight between Luffy and Crocodile is kind of just a whole lot of, not a whole lot, because every time Luffy hits him, he turns into sad and it's just like, I feel like Luffy's intentionally annoying him and annoying him and annoying him, which is a great thing because I feel like when Crocodile loses control, maybe that will be an in for Luffy. It almost feels like, and I only mentioned this because I watched the episode the other day, but in the Pokemon episode, when the two Metapods are fighting one another and they both just use Harden for the fight, that's kind of what it feels like between Crocodile and Luffy right now because it just feels like neither of them are winning or losing. And yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going to turn the tables, but I think Crocodile losing his shit might be the one that turns the tables in Luffy's favour. Hopefully. <laughs> I do like making these kind of predictions and then finding out in the next chapter that I'm totally wrong. So I hope you also love that because there's nothing I love more than being proven wrong. Well, shit just got real. That panel of Crocodile impaling Luffy with his hook Oh, 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 that hurt. What we need is for Ace to come back, is what we need. That's what we'd be missing. That's what we need to win this fight. We need Ace. I mean, I thought Luffy's intention was to make Crocodile mad so that he would react irrationally and then Luffy could beat him. But that's, that's not what's happening. <laughs> Luffy is trying his best to stop Crocodile, but he just can't do it. Crocodile's powers are just too strong and he's in a desert. And he had the sand sand fruit, I think it was called again. And he has all of this power. And Luffy is just absolutely powerless against him in the desert. There's just no way, there's nothing I can think of that will stop him. And the scariest part of Crocodile's power as well is when he can like mummify you because the sand takes all the moisture and stuff. And then Luffy does have the water that Toto has from Yuba. So that saves him again, coming back to other things that happened in previous chapters that have came back and helped Luffy. But I don't know how much it's gonna help because now Crocodile has sent a sandstorm to Toto and Yuba and 
It's just going to get worse. And now Luffy's been impaled. Oh, would you look at that? I've been impaled. But that is just a gut-wrenching panel that I just watched there. Gut-wrenching. So now what's going to happen to Toto? Is he going to be the one to die? We did have the Doctor's death in Drum Island that absolutely tore me apart. We cannot have another one of those moments. I really don't want to repeat of that. That speech, oh. But Crocodile's powers are fantastic. I absolutely love them. As much as I want him to stop, I can't stop being in awe of the things he can do. Just, oh, quicksand? Split the desert in half? Just, pff, really cool powers. Really cool antagonist. <laughs> I feel like a lot of these chapters are build up and build up, build up and build up. And then we finally get the thing we need with the little bits sprinkled out throughout. So in the previous chapter, we did have the fight between Luffy and Crocodile, which end in Luffy being appealed. This one is this sort of immediate aftermath after that. With Luffy, he's still alive, but barely. And he is still in trouble. I feel like this entire chapter was kind of like thinned out so that we can still get that tension and that kind of rhythm towards this big battle that's happening, happening at Alubane. We will get there eventually. I'm just waiting for that to, to sort of kick in. Not really a whole lot to say about this chapter, so I'm just gonna move on. I love how in the question corner, Oda replies to a question, well, I, more of a comment really. A girl has said, a friend said to me, you're a girl, why are you reading Shonen Jump? So I said, why shouldn't a girl read Shonen Jump? Is it against the law? I was a boy in my previous life, probably. And I've only just started to become familiar with different terminology in manga. So I didn't realise that there was, I mean, I know like Shonen Jump, I thought maybe that was a publisher, which it is. Shonen Jump is a boys magazine. So really it is catered towards boys more. Whereas there are ones that are for girls. I don't really know the word for it. Is it shoujo or something like that? I am really slowly starting to understand manga terms. So I apologise for my obliviousness. I'm like Luffy when it comes to manga. I'm a little bit clueless. But I love Order's response saying, as long as they understand a boy's fiery spirit, boys, girls, all guys and all ladies are all welcome. Darn it. So yeah, it doesn't matter if you're a girl or a boy or non-binary. It doesn't matter at all. As long as you're enjoying what you're reading, then read it. And I love that. I love that so much. Oh, there were so many yes moments during this chapter as well. This chapter was just... Mm. I understand now why I'm feeling so uncomfortable, not exactly uncomfortable. Um, you know how before I said I was like getting a little bored or something with the whole lead up to something that's happening in the future? I understand because liminal zones make me feel very uncomfortable. And I think the whole time between declaring this kind of war with the king, for instance, by the rebels, to something actually happening with that, and same with the Baroque works and their plan, and the time it takes to get to that the liminal zone in between makes me uncomfortable. I mean, the suspense is fantastic and it's very exciting, but I do think I have a big fear. Again, like so many fears are coming out. A big fear of liminal zones, like the time between. And the time between, it makes my skin itch, you know? I, I just kind of want to get to the, I, I want to say the fireworks, you know? But at the same time, I appreciate what happens between. I understand that you have to build up to that. But yeah, when I mention about like, oh, I just want to get to this thing, it's because that limbo in the middle of the action makes me uncomfortable, which is a May problem. It's totally a May problem. It's not One Piece's problem. It's just, we're in a bit of a liminal zone right now. I loved, I absolutely loved seeing Kuro again and his supersonic duck squadron. Oh, I love this. Like, they're definitely going to win now, aren't they? They're definitely going to win this fight. When you have Karu, you have everything you need. Oh, and I was so shocked that Miss All Sunday helped Luffy. She got him out of the sand. And she mentions as one of those whose name is D. Just who are you people? And she's trying to find out or work out the D part of it. Now, I had a couple of comments on my last video where I mentioned the whole D thing. And a few people have said they still don't know what the day means and we're on chapter a thousand and something so this is only what chapter 180 yeah i still have like what another 800 900 chapters ago and i still won't know oh my lord this is the liminal zone now <laughs> from starting the day mystery to when we finally get the answer this is a liminal zone for me i'm in agony <laughs> ah there's so much i need to know now and i'm just Oh, I just want it all. Yeah, we are still on our way. Oh my God, oh my God. Igaram is alive. I was genuinely concerned that he was dead dead. And I was so relieved when I saw him approaching. I think he was in, what city was he in? There's just so many different places I need to remember. It was in Nanohana. So he's there. We're all on our way to Alabana, the rebels, the straw hats. And it's, 
again, like, I just, this, this is gonna be an explosion. But this chapter definitely gave me stuff and took stuff from me. I need to know about the day. I need to know about Igaram, how he survived. I need to know about Miss Whole Sunday, whose side is she on? Will they make it to Alabama? <laughs> or will it take another five chapters? Important questions. I just looked and chapter 180 actually published on my ninth birthday, May 7th, 2001. I'm now 30. I am 21 years behind on One Piece. 21, the, when I think of it like that, I feel so sad. <laughs> I'm so behind. But this was a great chapter, actually. I loved the fact that we saw some of the Straw Hats have this strategy of using, like, decoys and leading, like, Mr. One, Mr. Four, Miss Doublefinger, and Miss Merry Christmas away from the main gates and confusing them about which one is Vivi. So they do have like their own disguises and it was funny as well because eyelashes was in on that plan. And poor eyelashes. Eyelashes looked like they were crying. They did. I, I want to show you the panel so bad but again I'm a little bit wary about showing panels now. Oh poor eyelashes though. They look scared. Whereas Nami's sticking her tongue out. Usopp has one finger in his eye. Zoro looks mischievous as usual. But it's great to see them have this really strong plan that works, that actually works. And to see them have this small victory in this small little battle there. The supersonic ducks I think might be my favourite creatures. I probably say this a lot about different creatures I'm introduced to in One Piece. But I think the supersonic ducks just, oh, slide straight into first place for me. So useful and it's also Karu's time to shine too. Ah, it was a crazy chapter and I loved every minute of it. <laughs> first let me talk about the funny things in this chapter before we get into the whole we're at war part of my review. Funny thing, Usopp tells Sanji about how it took two seconds for Usopp and eyelashes to get beat up by the Baroque Works members. And poor eyelashes. Eyelashes looked beat up, like very beat up. Like, why would you beat up a camel? That's horrible. Poor Vivi never managed to stop the battle. She was so close, so close. And if the Baroque Works hadn't infiltrated the Royal Army, then maybe Vivi could have had a chance to have changed their mind, the rebels' mind, about going into battle. But nope, the battle is in full swing and I love, 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 love Vivi's determination. She says that even though the battle has started, she will never give up no matter how many times she gets knocked down. And it's something she learned from being with the Straw Hats. And Vivi like belongs in this team. She belongs. And I hope she doesn't leave them in Alabasta. I hope she doesn't... I mean, I, I hope they have a great ending in Alabasta. I hope they save the city. But I hope Vivi doesn't stay behind as well. I don't want her to leave. But I feel like her heart is so strong. And she has so much love for her country. That I feel like she might have to stay. There's part of me... This is just a prediction. There's part of me that will think the king might die in this battle. We haven't seen him in a while. And I just think it ain't gonna end well for him. Because Oda apparently loves to tear my heart out and stamp on it. So even though I don't really care if the king dies, I don't really like him that much. I mean, I do. He's a fine, he's a fine character. But I love Vivi more and I don't want Vivi to be upset. I don't want her to have that loss on her. And I want him to survive so that he can still look after the kingdom while Vivi goes off on adventures with the Straw Hats. That's what I want. But as we've seen before, my predictions suck. Mr. Two tried to trick Vivi by making his appearance as Usopp with the whole band thing as well. Like they all had this band that they put on their arms so that they could differentiate so that when Mr. Two turns into them, they'll know that it's just Mr. Two, not the real people. But Mr. Two has one of those bands on. But Mr. Zero had told him that they all were wearing them. So that part of the plan was out. But it was a great idea though. It was a great idea. But at least Vivi knows deep down how the real Usopp is. And I feel like she would be able to do that with all of the Straw Hats. Like they didn't really need that band. They don't really need that to know in their heart who the real Straw Hat is. And in this case, it was not really Usopp and Vivi knew that straight away. And also Mr. Two is just a bad actor. I, the fact that he came in and said, leave the bird. And oh, Karu, Karu defended Vivi and got hurt in the process. 
Oh, that was so beautiful. There's a lot that is hitting me in this arc. Yeah, I guess as soon as Mr. Two said, forget that bird, it's a goner, it was so heartless that obviously it wouldn't be Usopp. And wait, as readers knew of that, because in the previous scene, Usopp had been beaten up and was with eyelashes. Poor eyelashes. But great to see the battle in full swing. I wonder how long it lasts. And it doesn't look like Corsa is very open to talking to Vivi about this battle. I'm not sure how open he will be in the future. It's gonna take a lot of effort on Vivi's part to change his mind. So I hope Vivi's up for the challenge and I think she is because she's absolutely incredible. Okay, I still think that Vivi would have figured it out that it wasn't Usopp. I loved the flashback to when they decided to use the band to differentiate between the real ones and the fake ones if Mr. Two ever becomes them. But it actually turns out that's kind of a double bluff and Zoro came up with the idea that there should be like an X under the band and whenever they are confronted with one another and they don't know if they're the real person then all you have to do is show them underneath and to show the cross and they'll know it's them. So that is really really freaking clever. Okay, that was really, really smart. I have to hand it to Zoro for that incredible plan. But I do still think Vivi knows enough of the Straw Hats to figure it out without having to say the X, okay? I just know her and I know she knows the Straw Hats. I know sh she knows her friends. They are so close now. They are great friends that it doesn't matter what they do. They will always know whether they're going to be the real one or the fake one. I stand by it. So my analysis in the previous chapter about Vivi and her relationship with Straw Hats still stands up, okay? Karu was the absolute goat in this chapter. He was incredible. He flew. <laughs> he got Vivi up the side of the cliff and flew. Never underestimate a duck. Wise words. That whole chase, the whole trying to get away from Mr. Two to end up seeing Karu get shot shot. Kuro's been through so much. Can he just have a break? Literally went above and beyond because he flew. And he got Vivi out of immediate danger. So yes, and went straight into a battlefield for her. Double yes. I'm getting really worried about Luffy now because he hasn't appeared in a few chapters. I'm getting really concerned. We do see more of Miss Merry Christmas's power. She is a sort of mole. She can dig I think she had a dig dig fruit or something like that. And Mr. Four, he can bat these balls and one of them exploded in front of Usopp. So he must have exploding balls. <laughs> uh, we have buggy balls and we have exploding balls from Mr. Four. Apparently he's a clean up hitter. I hope Usopp's okay as well. I mean, that looked like it hurt. Yes, Captain Usopp. We really have to push Usopp into fighting back sometimes. He does take quite a clobbering to begin with. And I like the team of Usopp and Chopper in the almost comedic duo of Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas, which that name, <laughs> I never ever thought I would say there would be a villain in something I enjoy where a villain or antagonist is called Miss Merry Christmas. I just never thought those words would come out of my mouth. This chapter was pretty much Usopp and Chopper versus Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas. So it was quite fun to learn the tactics of each team and to see how Mr. Four uses Lasso, who is this big dog gun, and how they work and the whole hitting the ball thing and the timer going off and the balls exploding. Very interesting stuff. And then Miss Merry Christmas as well turns into a mole. Like she actually transforms into a mole. I just thought she had mole powers. So she could just burrow. She didn't have to turn into a mole. But oh no, she transforms into a mole. Even though Usopp was like a penguin. <laughs> it's also so weird that inanimate objects can eat devil fruits as well. How? How? That's insane to me. But a dog gun is... I thought I've seen it all. And then another chapter of One Piece comes along and it gets even crazier. And I'm like, okay, I haven't seen it all. And I don't think I will ever see it all. <laughs> but I'm hoping Usopp and Chopper beat Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas to the ground. Okay, it was obvious that Usopp wouldn't have a five ton hammer. However, he did get me for a second. <laughs> I mean, Usopp has such a knack in talent for lying that he can even make me believe him sometimes. <laughs> and the fact that Chopper was so gullible enough as well. I mean, I say Chopper was gullible, I'm gullible. But the fact that Chopper was nodding along like, wow, incredible, was, it sold the show. And that's what Usopp is, he's a showman. He is a showman. And the plan was going pretty well for a little bit. And then obviously it falls apart because lies don't really have a big foundation. So that mache five ton hammer didn't last very long. 
And that's fine, you know, Usopp lasted as long as he needed to. An incredible teamwork with Chopper 2 and them using the balls or putting the dog's face down the hole, Chopper, by the way, and getting it to spit out the balls that explode in the mole tunnels because all of them are connected, which means Miss Merry Christmas is fucked. So I don't know if that's the end of them two, but it was a really good, interesting fight with them, had some comedic moments, had some serious moments. We had Usopp and Chopper using their strengths to their advantage, and it was a nice little, little thing, you know? I'm still ready to find out what happened to Luffy and to also get back to Vivi, but it was good. Oh my god, oh, I think the sweetest, oh my god, Usopp. Uh, how can you not like Usopp after this chapter, honestly? Like, yes, he runs away, yes, he's a coward every now and then, he lies a lot, but like, Oh, the way he stood up for Luffy when Miss Merry Christmas said that Luffy was dead and she started laughing when Usopp said, no, he can't be dead, he's gonna be king of the pirates. And like, she laughs at Luffy's dream and Usopp's like, I will not stand for you laughing at my friend's dream. This is the time for me to fight. And he fight, he does. Oh, that was so sweet. Oh. Usopp isn't my favourite, okay, by any stretch of the imagination, but I absolutely adore him still. He is such a vital member of the team and he keeps proving that time and time again. Loved it. And again, I love how Chopper helped out as well. Chopper has really proven himself and it was a great battle and they won. It actually said at the end that they won because I was a little unsure at the end of the previous chapter, but no, it says Usopp and Chopper win the Battle of Alabama Southeast Gate. Oh, so they won and I knew they would. I knew they would win. But oh my God, for a moment I was like, is Usopp gonna die here? Because Usopp was so bloodied up. Like he was so beaten up. And even Miss Merry Christmas was like, you should not be alive. You were cracked over the head with a four-ton bat. Usopp, what the hell? So obviously Upop, Upop? So obviously Usopp is way stronger than we realize. I mean, it might be something that like never happens again, but incredible, absolutely incredible. He keeps surprising me. Really loved Chopper's new transformation into Home Point. That was quite intimidating and scary. Like I cannot wait to see a battle where all of them are together and they all take on their foes rather than them being broken up into little battle teams and then I think there's just no stopping them. They will be unbeatable. So now I finished volume 20 and I want to volume 21. I might take a bit of a break though even though I'm dying to find out what happens next. I'm just I'm feeling this arc again. I was honestly because the whole in-between thing I was feeling a little bit unnervy. Unnervy is that the right word? Unnervy. But now we're like really into the swing of things I'm just really enjoying my time. I love this volume cover as well. It has the Baroque works all in a line. That is so cool, I like that. I haven't really paid attention to the volume covers because I don't want spoilers for future characters and things. So this is a total surprise. I love seeing the volume covers. Let's move on to volume 21. Can't believe I'm 21 volumes into One Piece now. <laughs> I only started two months ago. This is just gonna be a quick update. I don't have much to say about this chapter. The battle's in full swing. Vivi has reached Chaka, who is the commander of the Royal Guard. Kosa is still trying to fight his way, even though he got injured in the previous chapter. The big thing was the Sanji versus Mr. Two fight, which Mr. Two tries to use his whole different appearance trick in order to trick Sanji into thinking that he is his friend. And it doesn't work on Sanji. Sanji's like, hm, you can't try that with me. It's about heart, not the appearance. And then Mr. Two turns into Nami and Sanji... Sanji's an idiot, but I love him. He's an adorable idiot. So I don't know if this Nami trick will work. Hopefully not, but it'll be actually interesting to see Sanji potentially fight Mr. Two, who has changed into Nami, maybe? I don't know if Sanji has the heart to even try and fight someone who looks like Nami. I mean, you'll know deep down it's Mr. Two, but because he loves women so much, like so much, it just clouds his judgment. So... It'll be interesting to see how he deals with that. Hopefully he has a little bit of character development and pushes past that in order to look past the Nami exterior and saves himself. It was also really nice as well to see Vivi say, destroy the palace. This isn't Alabasta. The people are Alabasta. It doesn't matter if the whole thing gets destroyed. It is about the people. So that was really nice and a really great theme and message for the whole Alabaster arc. So I think I'm just gonna try and finish this volume tonight and continue on 
with the next two volumes and then the chapter in volume 24 that will cover the rest of the Alabaster Saga and then that's me done. I could have went on further tonight but I have stuff to do later so yeah I'm gonna plow on and get this volume read. Okay Sanji can't resist Nami. Who can? Who can? Yeah Sanji can't bring himself to attack Mr. Two even while he is Nami but what's great about Sanji is that he's so smart in that he looks at patterns and he looks at attack patterns and how Mr. Two uses his power and he starts to look for the flaws in his power and what he can possibly do in order to take him down even though it seems like Sanji is losing and that's what I love about Sanji he really takes in his surroundings he gets his bearings and he delivers <laughs> so he does end up finding out a bit of a weakness of Mr. Two's about how he can't really attack or use his attacks while he's transformed into someone else because I think Mr. Two has only learned those attacks as his original form. It honestly does sound like a video game and I love it. There's also a strange thing as well where Mr. Two turns back into his original form when he touches his left cheek which I'm doing this. This is my left cheek. I'd be rubbish as Mr. Two. I'd have to be like <laughs> and Sanji will end up using that to his advantage. He hasn't quite taken down Mr. Two yet but learning his patterns, learning his moves has been such a great experience watching that it makes me think, hmm, if I was in that position, would I be as smart as to take in those kinds of observations? Uh, pretty good. Sanji versus Mr. Two is still on. And yeah, the cover stories as well follow Hachi, just their underwater adventures, essentially. So yeah, I am reading the cover stories. Not much to say about it. Haven't been as invested as I was with Django, but we're going to see how it goes. I'm only on volume seven of Hatchie's Walk on the Sea Floor. Although I will say the locations and the locale, gorgeous. Cover of chapter 189, which is volume seven of it, is beautiful. So many fish. I hope we get to see more of the underwater with our main straw hats. I love how we're tackling each location and we have a different straw hat battling someone else. Now we have the North Block and it's Mr. One and Miss Doublefinger versus Zoro and Nami. So this is going to be really exciting because I've been really anticipating Zoro and Nami putting their toes into the battle. Especially since, you know, Zoro and Nami are Two of the original Straw Hats, along with Luffy, and they're always the most interesting to me. And as much as I love Usopp and Chopper and Vivi, of course, and even Sanji, it's great to see the original three. Although I am still so worried about Luffy. Where the hell is he? Oh my god, how many chapters has it been without him now? Like 10, 12? So many without Luffy. But anyway, Sanji did end up kicking Mr. Two's butt. And I'm so happy. He honestly deserved that win. He deserved that win. And the fact that he could have finished off Mr. Two and just didn't is such a testament to oh, how great these characters are. And how great Sanji is as well. There probably was a time where he would have finished him off. But because he's been with the Straw Hats, he's learned so much. Although the amount of blood in this series as well, the blood that's running down Sanji's face is concerning. It's so concerning. How do these characters not have concussions? They need to be going to the hospital more, I tell you. I did love that he took the goggles off Mr. Two, though. And it did say that the spoils of victory, a dubious friendship. So I wonder if Mr. Two is going to come back and, I don't know, pay it forward. Sandy showed him kindness and I feel like Mr. Two will end up repaying that later on in the future. As we've seen numerous times in the series so far and how much of an effect people's consequences have. So, I feel like this was a good thing. This was definitely a good thing. The chapter ends with Zoro and, well, Nami running away from Mr. One and Miss Doublefinger. And Mr. One says, crush the weaker talker first. While they chase Nami. And I'm like, okay. I mean, obviously Zoro is going to be the greatest swordsman in the world, right? But Nami, don't underestimate Nami. Don't say she's the weaker target. She might not be as skilled a fighter as Zoro. But she has her own strengths just like Zoro has his, and she has her own weaknesses, just like Zoro has his. So don't underestimate my Nami. I hope they get their butts handed to them from Nami herself. I mean, I hope Zoro has a really good fight out of it too, but I want Nami to put the final nail in their coffin. I really do. As a big fuck you to the Baroque works. Like, how dare you? Crush the weaker target first? Look, you're both the weaker target in this equation. I'm taking the funny moments as they come because they've been few and far between because we're literally in the thick of it. So when Nami asked Usopp on the ship 
to make her some weapons. And it's just a panel where Nami says, you'll do it, thank you Usopp, I love you. Now about the cost of materials, thank you so much. Yeah, but weapons like this don't come cheap. I'm counting on you. It's like Nami is the tightest person ever. Like she is such a cheapskate. She'll take money off people no problem. And she's probably the richest out of all of the straw hats, let's be honest, from stolen goods. But when it comes to her actually paying for stuff, she's like, I'm out. And I love it. I respect it. I love how her humour is usually tied up with things to do with money, finances and stuff like that. And yeah, that was just a really nice, funny moment, which I thought I would point out because the rest of the chapter is a lot of running around, a lot of running away. Nami is running away from Miss Doublefinger. And Miss Doublefinger, she has had the spike spike fruit. And she can now make spikes from her body, which oh, I do not want another impaling incident ever since Luffy. Like, no more impaling, please. But yeah, Nami has this weapon that Usopp made for her, but it doesn't really seem to be doing what she needs it to do. So I don't know if, like, I don't think Usopp would purposefully give her a weapon that was useless, but... At the same time, I also wouldn't be surprised, but at the same same time, I'm like, hmm, is there like something up Usopp's sleeve with this weapon? Is something gonna happen? Is it gonna lull Miss Double Finger into a false sense of security? And then Nami's gonna whip out the real weapon and blast her with it. Is that what's gonna happen? We will shop, find out. And Zoro is fighting Mr. One. And Mr. One is a human sword, which is the perfect four for Zoro because Zoro is going to be the greatest swordsman. I would love to see Zoro use Mr. One as a sword. I feel like that would be hilarious. But I also don't know how he's going to beat him. I love the smack talk between Zoro and Mr. One as well, and how Zoro was like, ha, I was going to join you guys, but your boss turned down my conditions because I wanted to be the boss. And Mr. One's like, don't get caught with me. You're just the swordsman of a little band of all count pirates. And Zoro says, so what if I am? What are you? You're a mindless puppet who's been sold a fantasy world. Or maybe you're more like a hollow tin soldier. Oof. That is probably like one of the sickest burns like Zoro has ever come out with. Probably one of the sickest burns in One Piece history. So far anyway. But I love how we have... Mr. One and Zoro fighting, and then we have Nami and Miss Doublefinger fighting as well. Oh my god, I almost shit myself. Oh. <sighs> For a second there, I thought Nami had been impaled by Miss Doublefinger's spikes. Oh god. <laughs> I definitely need a break after this volume, because god damn, my nerves are shot. It's hilarious. I mean, I mentioned, I think in the previous chapter, that funny moments were hard to come by while we're in the thick of the battle but this entire chapter was just oh filled with so many good funny moments like especially since Nami has this baton this weather baton that Usopp created for her and she has the instruction manual and it keeps saying or it keeps doing things that are like party tricks and then Nami's like stop it with the parties and then it says something like combat instructions on the reverse side so Nami's like oh you know, it's just, it's so funny. And it's like such a life or death situation. It is literally mortal combat. And yet still, it just, it's not 100% serious, is it? I love that. Oh, but my favourite moment, I love this moment so much. Probably my favourite Nami moment is when, you know, Nami's figured it out and she is ready for the fight and she goes, don't mistake me for a helpless little girl. And the panel of her with the baton on her shoulder and she's got this pose. Oh, I want this image of Nami printed off and put on a poster. But the fact that she's able to create a mirage with the baton and she's worked out the whole hot air cold air that the baton creates is just so genius. Again, she's like Sanji in the fact that she really uses her wits to outsmart the villain or outsmart the antagonist that she is fighting with. And she just did a fantastic job. This is why I love Nami so much. The fight is not over. Still scared. Still scared. You know, she's just finally figuring out this baton. Whereas Miss Doublefinger is very skilled and experienced with her spikes. So, yeah. Oh, God. I just don't want Nami to be appealed with these spikes. That was a really... That had me... That had me for a second. <laughs> what in the world is a Pluton? What in the world is a Pluton? Why does Crocodile want the Pluton? I mean, at least we know that the king, Cobra, is still alive. But Crocodile wants a Pluton? Beats me. This is the first I've heard of it. And Cobra's confused as to how he's heard of it. So, something stinks. We have had the return of Miss All Sunday, or albeit very minutely. And we also have Sanji, Chopper, Usopp, and Eyelashes reunite. I think Eyelashes might be my favourite character. I'm not even joking. Like, just the name. 
<laughs> I want you guys to stop calling me eyelashes if that's okay. Because I actually do have quite nice eyelashes, if you ask me. Anyway, the fight between Nami and Miss Double Finger is still afoot. And yeah, Nami's just experimenting. She is able to electrocute Miss Double Finger, but she's still not done yet. However, she did do another mirage. And I love it. It's just the dialogue with Nami saying, and now for today's weather, humidity and wind are both moderate with high atmospheric pressure. Should be a fine sunny day. However, in one particular area, there is a possibility of mirages and strong winds. So I love how Nami is using her knowledge as a navigator and the weather and things like that to her advantage in this fight. Like, not every fight is the same. And I love that. Each fight is different. So it's not easy, especially since even Miss Doublefinger's face can become a spike. Her hair, her hands. It's just, she becomes so creepy looking when she does that. Like, terrifying. I feel like Nami has such a formidable foe in Miss Doublefinger. And such a violent and potentially deadly foe as well. Like, it's getting so close. And we do end the chapter with Nami warning of tornadoes. So, I mean, hot air, cold air, all this, that and the other with the atmosphere can all amount to a potential tornado. But yeah, I just kind of want to, well, one, see Nami win. And two, find out what in the world this Pluton thing is. I had absolutely every faith that Nami would win. Didn't I say, didn't I have zero doubts and zero questions of Nami's strength? And her weight to overcome Miss Doublefinger. I believe I said that. I believe I said it twice. But she did win and she used the tornado knockout move. And she did a fantastic job, honestly. And oh, when she gets her foot impaled in the spikes. And she says this is nothing compared to what Vivi's had to go through. And, you know, the pain of the foot is nothing compared to that. And just... Her continuing on through pain, through agony, and just oh, smashes Miss Doublefinger. Well, not exactly off the face of the earth, but pretty damn near close. It was a fantastic fight, honestly. Like, I had my heart in my mouth for a lot of it. It did look like Nami would lose, but I knew, I knew she would come back swinging. And the fact that Mr. One said that she was the weaker target, it's just like, do not underestimate Nami. Look at where your partner is now. Speaking of Mr. One, he is fighting Zoro, so it's going to be interesting to see how this battle differentiates from other battles, especially since Zoro will have to cut through steel in order to stop him. And Zoro loves that challenge, and I love that for Zoro. He is like, this is the moment I've been waiting for, the fact that he can't defeat him the way he is fighting now, but once he does defeat him, he will be able to cut through steel. He will defeat Mr. One, and he will be able to cut steel once this fight is over. And it's just going to add to his experience to becoming the greatest swordsman in the world. It's just going to... Mm, I can see his experience points getting through the roof after this fight. I really do. He's going to be levelling up after this. Also, we did find out more of what the Pluton is. Apparently it vaporises an entire kingdom. Or even an island. It can vaporise an entire island to smithereens with just one shot of it. He also has a cannon that is going to be fired into the palace or like the palace courtyard where the rebels will be fighting. And that is also a ticking time bomb. Like seriously, everything's going wrong at the minute. But also really right because we have won so many battles. But Crocodile is still untouchable at the minute. But Crocodile also wants the Pawn Glyph. Not Pawn Glyph. Oh my God, that sounds bad. Poneglyph. Maybe Poneglyph. Apparently it's a record of history and Cobra is going to show Crocodile where it is. So that's most likely a bad thing. I genuinely believe that Zoro and Mr. One would be perfect friends were they not on other sides, opposing sides. Because, oh, their banter, the way they kind of trash talk one another, so much friendship possibility, you know? It's when Mr. One tells Zoro, you'll never cut me, no swordsman has, and Zoro says, but you've never met someone like me before. And then a bit later on, when Mr. One gets back up after Zoro knocks him down, Zoro's like, well, that's never happened to me before. And Mr. One says, of course, you've never met someone like me before. And it's like, this is just great banter between enemies. Great banter between enemies. I love the fact that we had a little bit of a flashback as well with Zoro and trying to get to a place where he can cut through steel. And he has to sort of learn more about the sword in doing so. But also seeing Zoro train, because I think I mentioned this in one of the previous arcs, about how Zoro seems to be the only one we ever see train. 
And Zoro was, I think, training to have a moment like this where he does eventually cut steel. So seeing those moments from previous arcs of Zoro training either on the ship or elsewhere, it's so satisfying to see that this could potentially come to a head. Now, Mr. One is still very much standing. It was a pretty scary moment as well when Zoro was like thrown into a house and the building like collapsed on him. But then, of course, Zoro, with his superhuman strength, <laughs> decides to throw it at Mr. One. So I love that we had Nami using her wit to overcome Miss Doublethinger. And now we have Zoro kind of going back on his training and learning from what he's already learned and what he's been trying to learn to try and defeat Mr. One. Ah, oh, I just love how these battles are just coming along so beautifully. So beautifully. God, I'm loving it again. Like, I don't want to stop reading. There was a moment, wasn't there, like 10, 15 chapters ago when I was like, I could probably stop for the day, but I, I can't stop reading. I think I've got one chapter left of this volume before I, you know, go and do other things I need to do. Oh, but the temptation to just continue is strong. Let's continue. Let's read the last chapter of the night. Wow, Zoro. Like, the moment where he learns how he can actually cut through steel and he begins to hear the breathing of the world around him, essentially, and the breathing of the steel. Like, that is how he overcomes Mr. One and he defeats him. It was epic. It was amazing. And I... Again... <laughs> I should stop thinking that my main character... No, I shouldn't. I should still worry for them. But when the blades happen on Mr. One's arms and just the devastating injuries that Zoro gets, it's like, there's so much blood here. Like, how? what? <laughs> it's just... It really is incredible. And then Zoro just... Oh, he just... He keeps surprising me, honestly. What a satisfying fight. To see Zoro finally cut through steel and defeat Mr. One. Oh, it was the moment I've been waiting for my entire life. And I didn't realise I've been waiting for that moment my entire life. Epic, amazing, just a great fight overall. I just, I can't pick a favourite fight now. A lot of them have just been so good. And have genuinely worked to every single main character's strengths. And even their weaknesses at times too. It's put every single character to the test. And all of our straw hats so far have come through a winner. The only one who hasn't really yet is Luffy. I'm so scared. Like, hopefully we get Luffy soon. He's been missing this entire volume. What an epic turn of events. I'm floored. Floored by the Zoro versus Mr. One fight. Floored by the Nami versus Miss Doublefinger fight. Floored by it all. Floored by the Sanji versus Mr. Two fight. Floored by the Usopp and Chopper versus... Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas fight. I'm so impressed with myself for remembering everyone's names. Honestly, usually I'm very bad with remembering so many names at once, but One Piece, for some reason, has a bit of an exception in my brain. And I think it's just because I've been loving it. I've been absolutely freaking loving it. Okay, I finished volume 21. So now we are on volume 22. It's another one of those shiny gold foil ones. And I love how it's... Oh my God. Is this like a... One of those covers that go together? Or is it like, oh no, it goes like this. Sorry, I'm dumb. Yeah, it goes together like this. Let's see if it, you can see it. Ah, oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. I love how our straw hats and eyelashes as well are looking at the Baroque works that are all in line. Yeah, I really need to get on with something that I've left last minute till the very end of the month. And if I don't do it, then I don't get paid. So I said I desperately do need to do it. But this is the power of One Piece. This is making me just think, you know what? If I don't get paid, I don't get paid. But <laughs> I just want to finish the Alabasta saga so bad. Chapter 196 was essentially just confirming that Zoro had defeated Mr. One. An interesting development with some of the gods of Alabasta. They drank some special portion that means that they will die but their powers are enhanced before they die so they try and fight crocodile but obviously they can't do that it keeps turning into sand so we need to figure out a way and by way i mean us to defeat crocodile without him turning into sand because that's like such an annoying move not gonna lie it's so annoying he needs to pack it in chaka also transformed into a jackal he ate some kind of devil fruit that means he can turn into a jackal and that's a cool and interesting power. However, he's easily defeated by Crocodile as well. Literally no one can defeat him right now. Not a single person. I need Luffy to come back. 
so that he can whip his ass. But he's still MIA. We're approaching chapter 200, and I feel like that's quite a special chapter milestone. So maybe he comes back for that chapter, fingers crossed. Also, there's a 25 minute ticking time bomb on the island of Alabaster, so yeah. So Luffy has got to get his ass up in 25 minutes, <laughs> preferably in 20 minutes, so that he has the five minutes flexibility to kick Crocodile's ass. I do not believe for a minute that Cosa is dead. Every single time I think someone's died, it never happens. The only person whose death has really stuck with me after thinking, oh, they're definitely gonna be dead, is Dr. Hiraluk, I think his name was, in the Drum Island arc. Oh, and what a way to go as well. That speech still hits. But like, say, Igaram, he's alive. Zoro, many times he's alive. Even Mr. Three, you know, it's just like, it keeps looking like someone's got it, but they haven't got it, you know, they haven't died. So Kosa's just been shot. Yeah, the rebels think it's the King's soldiers who shot Kosa, but it's actually still the Baroque Works members who have infiltrated the army. So now it's even worse for the King's army. Looks worse for the good guys. Especially since we were so close to Kosa stopping the rebels from reaching the palace and really getting into this war. Crocodile confirmed that it was him all along, but the rebels may not ever hear that if Kosa dies. I, I don't think Kosa's gonna die, but I have, sometimes I've been wrong about deaths and things, but just my gut instinct is that he's still alive. It was interesting to see that the Jackal is the deity of Alabaster and Chaka transforms into a Jackal because of the fruit. So that's really cool symbolism. And I hope that Chaka is able to continue to defend his kingdom. I haven't really mentioned him much. He is a good character. He's not really been embellished or I haven't really got a connection with him yet, but I love his determination. I love his loyalty. And yeah, I think it's important because he is representing Alabaster. So there's still no end to Crocodile's Reign of Terror. And I don't know how he's gonna be defeated essentially, if he gets defeated. It also seems when we have a big bad per se, they are defeated, but sometimes they come back. Sometimes they come back. Luffy, Luffy's back. Oh my God, I have missed him so much. So much. I. Uh, What's it been, like 20 chapters or something without him? Oh, my heart. Oh, oh I'm so happy he's back. He's, he's back and he's gonna, he's gonna save the day. He's gonna save the day. I was beginning to lose hope. I was like Vivi. Like, I mean, Vivi, no, actually, Vivi hasn't lost hope. She's never lost hope, even to the last moment as Crocodile drops her over the edge and she's falling. She's still remembering her people. She's still remembering the lives she's touched and the lives that touched hers in Alabaster as a princess. What did Crocodile call it? Your idealism makes me want to vomit. Yeah, he's like constantly underestimating her. And the same with other Baroque Works agents, you know, they underestimate their foes and they get their asses handed to them every single time. So Vivi's determination, Vivi's need to save her kingdom. Look at what's happening now. Like the tables are turning. I'm so happy Luffy's back though. And what a great moment as well as Vivi's falling. And then you see something also falling from the sky above her. And it's Luffy and he's shouting crocodile. Oh my God, this is gonna be, oh, messy. This is gonna be messy. Luffy is gonna be pissed. He's gonna be pissed. And I just love the fact that he had the element of surprise because crocodile, thought he was dead. Like, he should be dead. Luffy should be dead if it wasn't for Miss All Sunday. Oh, this is gonna be dramatic. I hope we get Miss All Sunday's reasoning for saving Luffy as well. And what's she called Nico Robin as well? So hopefully that's explained too. I'm um, sensing betrayal. Oh man, I want, really wanna show you a panel. But it's a panel where the rebels and the King's army are like colliding into each other for this battle that Vivi has been hopeless to stop. That is a great panel, a really great double page spread. I'm scared to show you, copyright reasons, but it is a great, great, great exciting panel. Briefly talking about the cover stories as well, actually, it was the beginning of chapter 197 where we had Hachi's Walk on the Safe Floor, volume 14, the Mackerel Fisherman Pirates. And these fish people look strange. They look very strange. They kind of scare me a bit. Not gonna lie, they, their designs are weird. One of them has a fish head. The other one just has like a face, like a normal human face, but with like fishy kind of features. It's a weird combination. Sometimes Luffy is the smartest character in here. Sometimes, not all the time. Oh, he finally hit Croc. He hit him in the face. He got him. And I genuinely was expecting Crocodile to turn into sand again. But no, Luffy, like the other Straw Hats in their battles, learned the strengths and weaknesses of their opponents, learned their kind of maneuvers and their tricks and what have you, 
and adapted his own fighting style for that. But Luffy noticed during their fight beforehand that when water touches Crocodile, Luffy could grab him. So now Luffy has this barrel on his back with water and it's one of the reasons why Crocodile stole the rain because he's afraid of water. He's literally the Wicked Witch of the West. Oh, the moment when he smacks him in the face was so satisfying. Felt like I was smacking him in the face. Oh, and I love how all the straw hats are back together again as well. Oh, oh chapter 199, I love you so much. <laughs> I also love how Nami made Zoro carry her from the battlefield where they fought. And Zoro's getting really tired and Zoro's more injured than Nami as well. And she's like, I feel faint. And then as soon as she's confronting Usopp, she comes to life and she like beats Usopp and she's like, wait until I kill you. I told you, I asked you to make me a weapon, not a party favor. <laughs> it's Zoro's, I thought you couldn't stand up. Oh God, it's just, why do I love these characters so much? That's why, because at moments like this, we're confronted with a palace that's about to explode, a place that's about to explode, and we're still cracking jokes. We're cracking jokes. And Luffy is gonna kick Crocodile's ass. He is, oh, he really can be the smartest person on earth. Uh, and the way that I just was instilled with more hope as well when Luffy came back, it's everything he represents. You know, if Luffy had died, I mean, obviously he wouldn't have, but like that black hole, that feeling of being lost, that I felt since the chapter Luffy last appeared in was so indicative of Luffy's presence. Like he is so vital. He's the beaten heart of this series. And I needed him. I needed him more than the characters needed him to save Alabaster. I needed him for me. And having him just brought me so much joy. I felt joy. I felt hope, which is exactly what the chapter is called, it's called Hope. And I feel like with Luffy, Luffy? That's Luffy and Hope mixed together. That's what I get from Luffy. He just gives me so much hope and joy and all of the feelings. So I love Luffy. Water Luffy is incredible. I love Water Luffy. <laughs> it, you know what? Luffy and Vivi are so alike. Like even in the face of great odds that are against them, they're just still so passionate. Like when Crocodile says, I am one of the seven warlords of the sea, and Luffy says, if you're one of the seven warlords of the sea, then I'm the eighth warlord of the sea. That confidence is something else. I don't think I've ever seen a character as confident as Luffy. And it's a great plan as well, especially since water is going to be Crocodile's downfall, right? So he drinks all the water and he's like this big balloon, like this big water balloon. And <laughs> when he springs a leak as well, that's hilarious. And even Miss All Sunday slash Nico Robin laughs at that. Like, I love the fact that she can also kind of have fun with it. Why am I even rooting for Nico Robin slash Miss All Sunday? Well, she's an antagonist, right? She's on Crocodile's side, I think. Oh, I don't know what to think, in all honesty. Oh boy, I got a water belly. Maybe I drank too much. <laughs> Zoro and Sanji as well teaming up against the billions and then talking to each other like, we have 10 minutes left until the town explodes. How long do you think it's gonna to take to kick these guys' asses? And they're both like, two seconds. <laughs> Sanji and Zoro are a fantastic team. An absolutely fantastic team. I love when they fight together. I need to find out if Luffy kicks Crocodile's ass. Oh shit, shit, shit. It doesn't look very good right now. So the tables have turned again and it looks like Crocodile is kind of winning. Water Luffy is probably normal. It's just gonna be normal dried up Luffy and I guess that's fine. Luffy's gonna come back swinging, I just know it. The interesting part about this is that we did get a little bit more backstory on Nico Robin when she's confronted with Tashigi in the kind of town square and they don't know about the explosion and Nico Robin has the king, King Cobra, and he's getting him to help her find the, I can't want to call it the porn star, but it's not that, the poneglyph. So we'll find out exactly what that is soon, I think, because Nico Robin has Tashigi at sword point. And Nico Robin actually sunk a lot of marine ships when she was younger and was deemed a top level menace or something like that. And she has a huge bounty on her, but she's been missing for like the last eight years and no one's seen her since. So that's Nico Robin. She is against the marines, of course. She is, you know, the Baroque works. And although is she, is she, did she pull a Princess Vivi and did she infiltrate for her own end? She did a Pretty good job if that's the case then, being the right hand man of Croc, AKA Mr. Zero. This arc though so far has probably been one of the best fights in One Piece that I've read so far. 
all of the fights that have led up to this fight as well have just slot into place and have just been so satisfyingly amazing that I do think that the Croc versus Luffy fight is oh just so phenomenal. I can't call how it's gonna end. It just seems like it's gonna be in Luffy's favour for one minute and then it's not. It's in Croc's favour the next and vice versa. It's just it's keeping me on my toes and making me <laughs> have hope for one minute and then my hope is dashed the next, you know? So really exciting. We only got four minutes to save the world. No hesitating. Four minutes left. We've got four minutes. This fight has to come to an end in four minutes, like please. <laughs> I, I do love the fight. It's still amazing. It's still great. I'm just like ready for it to finish. I, I really am. I want Luffy to finally win. I don't know why he's toppled over at the end there. He is rather injured, of course. He got revived by the water, but like he's taken quite a beating, you know? So if he needs to rest for five, no, he doesn't have five minutes. He only has four. If he needs to rest for three minutes, then fine. But he is getting down to the last minute. It is tense up in here. The Poneglyph will reveal the location of the Pluton, which is what they've been after this entire time. And now Miss All Sunday, Sashniko Robin, has access to the Poneglyph because the king has shown her. Toshigi also told Luffy where Crocodile is, so it seems like there might be some kind of alliance there, as thin as it is. I mean, Toshigi seems very anal about her job and opposing pirates, but she has helped them. And I wonder what the consequences of that's gonna be for her and how that weighs in on her conscience and if her opinion on pirates change too. Will she continue to help the Straw Hats because she's seen the good that they do? But I feel like this whole alabaster arc for her has been such a test to her character that I feel like she might end up, I don't know, having some kind of identity crisis. Four minutes left. I don't think there's four minutes left for this vlog though. I'm pretty sure this vlog is like three and a half hours in raw footage. So <laughs> let's crack on. That hole looks crocodile-ish. <laughs> of course Luffy needed a nap. He couldn't move, so he decided to take a nap. Fair. He still has like two and a half minutes until the explosion, although actually at the very end of this chapter, it looks like something's been set off into the sky. So we're in danger, girl. And Vivi's kind of figured it out where it is and it goes back to a place that she went to as a child. So it's good that she worked that out. I just wish she worked it out a little bit sooner, not gonna lie, not gonna lie. This is Vivi's style, you know, waiting till the last minute uh, to remember things. But the biggest thing of this chapter is the fact that the Poneglyph did not reveal the location of the Pluton, which is all Crocodile wants. And we find out that Miss Whole Sunday had promised it to Crocodile that if they were partners, then she would be able to find it and decipher it and give him the location of this Pluton. But the Poneglyph doesn't reveal the location. So Crocodile says, I'm gonna have to kill you now, Nico Robin, because I don't need you anymore. And Nico Robin knew that this would happen and tries to fight. However, he does overcome her and stabs her in the back. Don't think she's dead though. I don't think she's dead. <laughs> I will never ever believe someone is dead unless there is some kind of funeral for them, you know? Or there's like a definite mangled body where they are dead beyond recognition. So hopefully Nico Robin will make it out of this. And as well as the king too. The king, bless his soul, is so loyal to his country and try to take Crocodile down himself by weakening one of the pillars so that they will be trapped there. But of course, Crocodile can turn into sand. So that doesn't really help. <laughs> and he can turn other things into sand too, so he can just turn the whole place into sand. But yeah, Luffy's now had his nap, so he should be ready to fight again. Which is such a weird thing to say, honestly. Like, I never thought I would say this about a hero of a story, where they're this deep in a battle, and they just fall asleep right before it. <laughs> right before, like, the final showdown. At least I think we're heading towards the final showdown. It's got to, it's got to. I only have one full volume after this and one chapter of the next to wrap up this alabaster arc. So come on, we've got this. Luffy not have water, but using blood instead is absolutely genius. Yet again, why did I not think of that? I feel like I'm dumber than Luffy half the time. If I was in any of these fights, I would have lost a long time ago. Also great to see Usopp protecting Vivi, which is great. And to see Tashigi helping Zoro as well to stop the explosion. Just, it's all coming together beautifully. What more can I say? It was a really short chapter, but really good. Love seeing Luffy with his 
you know, a hand full of blood. God, it's so gross though. Blood really icks me out. You gotta use what you gotta use to take this piece of shit down. Love how hard of a battle it's been. Like this is an exhausting, hard battle. It's not supposed to be easy and it doesn't look easy. One of my problems with even just like standard novels, a lot of the times when a hero faces a villain, the downfall is usually pretty easy. The fight is usually pretty quick and there's not really that much thought put into it. I feel like every single thought was put into this fight and it's going on and on and on because it's such a tough and difficult battle. I can feel the difficulty level. This is level 100 and me as a character, I'm like level five, you know? So this is such a nail-biting finale to Alabaster. I'm it's been so hard to read the chapter with this little man just directing me. I finished volume 22 and another great chapter again where you know who, or at least where the bomb is going to come from and we know who is going to be the bomber. It's Mr. Seven and Miss Father's Day. So they're two Baroque Works members that I don't believe we've met yet. This is the first time I've met them and they seem like a crazy pair in all honesty. They look like they're well suited together. They have a crazy look in their eyes. The fight between Luffy and Crocodile is still ongoing. And Crocodile does have like this poison hook thing. He says, I've won soon, the poison will start to take effect. And Luffy says, you still don't get it. And I'm like, what does Luffy know that I don't know? I feel like I should know something here. And I don't. And that worries me. I've been trying my best to make sure I read every little thing, look at every little panel, and try and figure out like everything that's going on in that panel. But I still feel like I've missed something. But no, another great chapter. At least we know where the bomb is. I feel like it should have been obvious that was coming from the clock tower. But at the same time, I didn't really clock on to it myself. Finishing volume 22 and on to volume 23, which feels a little bit thicker, actually. Are there more chapters in this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh, there's 11 chapters in this one. Usually there's around about nine or ten. So no wonder it feels a bit thicker. Everything's slowed down now because we have, what, like seven seconds? Seven seconds before the bomb goes. And I really liked the countdown and the other Straw Hats trying their best to, you know, stop this bomb from happening. So Nami's going to try and use her special power with the weather baton or the climbing baton. So they're working together right now to stop Mr. Seven and Miss Father's Day. And the thing that I thought I missed, I just thought Luffy had another trick up his sleeve to do with like his blood or with the water he had the previous time and became water Luffy. I thought he had another trick. The thing that I was missing, I wasn't really missing, but he's just not going to give up because Vivi will die and Vivi is his friend. I need a friend like Luffy for one. Somebody who's willing to die for me. I mean, not that I would want somebody to die for me, of course. But, you know, it's just nice to know the options there. And that's the thing Croc is missing. He's missing friendship. And that will probably be his downfall. The fact that Crocodile has betrayed pretty much everyone. He doesn't have a friend in the world. He only has people who work for him who will probably betray him at a moment's notice. Whereas Luffy has a whole team behind him. Oh, we're screwed. It doesn't even matter that Vivi managed to stop the bomb from exploding. It's going to explode anyway. It's on a self-timer. Which just shows that Croc has so little faith in his agents. And, you know, he is a master manipulator. He is an ultimate bad guy so like he does think of every eventuality in case something doesn't go right with his plan so like I he's so smart like, I respect it because he is incredibly intelligent and obviously it was a good thing that he had the timer you know just in case they didn't manage to light it but oh, Vivi tried so hard to stop it as well so now what's gonna happen how are they gonna stop it I don't think they can not unless they can they just like smash the thing up or something maybe point it high in the snow because they'll probably just end up finding the town anyway. <laughs> I don't know how they're going to do this. Like, this is why I'm not one of the straw hats. You know, I, I can't think of things like this. I would be the useless one in the background, looking pretty, but not being able to do much. But still, the tension is ripe and I don't know how much more I can go on. <laughs> I need this come down. I need the victory. I, I need to chill. I also need a new coffee as well. That one's gone cold. Oh, good grief. I'm so glad I made myself a coffee now. Gingerbread laddie, by the way, homemade. I needed the comfort. <laughs> that was, oh, I mean, it's okay. So Pell managed to stop the bomb by picking it up with his talons in falcon form and flying high above the city so that it wouldn't, you know, hurt anyone. It's essentially sacrificing himself for Alabaster because he is the guardian spirit of the place and all of their enemies shall be vanquished. 
So, oh god, somebody having that much loyalty to their kingdom is just so admirable. And then also having the flashbacks as well to when Vivi was a child and Pell would take her flying and stuff. That was very hard hitting. As well as the part where he slaps Vivi across the face. But other than that, very hard hitting, although technically it did hit Vivi in the face hard. Other than that, what an absolute trooper. What a champ. What a hero. He died a hero's death. Is he actually dead though? Is he actually dead? I feel like I should never make these assumptions. Is he actually dead though? I feel like you, there's no way you can survive that explosion. But said that before in the past, haven't I? Great chapter. Glad that the whole bomb threat is taken care of. Now it's just Crocodile who needs to be taken care of. And Luffy's still going. Luffy is still swinging. He says he's going to be king of the pirates and goddamn he will be one. So there's no way Crocodile can defeat him. Because I believe in Luffy. You believe in Luffy. The only person who doesn't believe in Luffy is Crocodile. And anyone who underestimates Luffy pays for it with their lives. Poor Pell. Oh, that was... Oh, I keep remembering. Oh, it does hurt a little bit, but we've got a soldier on for this final climax. I feel like I've had so many climaxes in this video. Mm. That came out wrong. I personally haven't had a climax since Ace's last chapter. There's only so many times I can hear Luffy say, I'm going to defeat you, and not defeating him. I feel like, right, okay, I feel like maybe the next chapter is when we'll get Luffy defeat him. I can only imagine how people felt when they were reading One Piece chapter by chapter back in this arc and waiting for Luffy to finally bring Croc to his knees. I can only imagine week by week waiting and waiting and waiting whereas all I have to do is wait a couple of minutes and I can read the next chapter you know. I dread the day when I catch up with One Piece and I have to read a chapter by chapter each week. I mean I can't wait for that as well because I'll be caught up and then I can talk to everyone about One Piece and I can watch all the One Piece videos I want on YouTube and not worry about spoilers and join in on all the conversations but at the same time I'm like oh but if I have to read this story chapter by chapter week by week I'm a binge it all in one go kind of guy. I'm not really great with the whole week by week life, but I guess I'll just have to adapt. But poor Vivi, she's still trying to get everyone to stop fighting too. She's shouting, stop fighting. Nami is telling the Straw Hats, come on, let's try and help them to stop fight, do whatever you can to stop them from fighting. They need to save as many lives as possible. This next chapter is called Zero. And the previous times when a Baroque Works member was beaten, was in a chapter that was named after them. So there was a chapter called Four, where Mr. Four got defeated. There was a chapter called Two, where Mr. Two got defeated. And a chapter called One, where Mr. One got defeated. So, Zero. Is this gonna be the chapter where Crocodile gets defeated? Can confirm he's been defeated. <laughs> and I love how Luffy's just grinning. And when the king thanks him, he's like, thank you so much. And Luffy's like, it was nothing. It's like, it was everything, come on. Like the amount of emotional turmoil that took, chapter after chapter after chapter, fighting Croc, just to have the whole, oh, it was nothing, you know. It's just a regular Tuesday. It's hilarious. The fact that we have rain coming back as well, it reminds me of, you know, a Cinderella story where it finally rains. It, I mean, it's a weird comparison, but that's how I associate it, okay? The relief, the way that Vivi's voice finally reaches everyone and they stop fighting. The rain is falling down. Croc is defeated. Luffy's grinning his grin. It's the best feeling ever when we reach... Well, it's not exactly the end of the arc just yet, but when we reach that point where the Straw Hats have won, oh, I'm on cloud freaking nine right now. Cloud nine. Everything is right in the world. I hope nothing goes wrong now. I mean, we've already had that huge sacrifice from Pell. I genuinely hope we don't have anything else that's going to traumatise me because I just can't be handling that right now. Oh, go Luffy. Yay. Oh, I'm so proud of Luffy and I'm proud of Vivi. I'm proud of the Straw Hats. Oh, yeah, it was a good fight. It was a very good fight. Croc did bring it, but Luffy brought it more. Oh, long live Alabasta. Long live Alabasta. All the fighting, all the war. Alabaster being in danger. It's all over. It's all over. I feel like the Baroque works are over as well. I mean, there's always a possibility of them coming back, but it, it's like closing the chapter on the Baroque works and the crocodile, Mr. One, Two, Three, Four, Five. Again, I'm just satisfied. I'm satisfied with how it unfolded. I'm satisfied with the fact that Igaram came back and is reunited with Vivi, so now they know he's alive. 
and the fact that Crocodile is being exposed as the master manipulator behind Alabaster's troubles. I just need to know about Toto. I still haven't forgot about Toto. I hope he's okay, especially since Cosa is fine too. But the whole speech from the king, Vivi being relieved for her friends, his safety. <sighs> how can I love you more? I'll tell you how I can love you more. Bring back Ace. Oh my, Smoker. I mean, I appreciate the fact that he's not going to take the credit for the defeat of Crocodile. And the government don't want to acknowledge the fact that the Straw Hat saved Alabaster and defeated Crocodile. So Smoker and Tashigi are going to get medals for taking down Crocodile, even though they didn't. And Tashigi's been crying because she could only sit back and watch as she pointed to Luffy where Crocodile was. Like, she couldn't defeat him herself. And, like, that, again, like, as I mentioned before, the tearing apart of her kind of morals. Like, what is morally right for her? What's the right sense of justice? really does play a huge effect on her and I really like that. I feel like she's at a breaking point and she was crying and Smoker tells her to toughen up and also we meet Black Cage Hina and I actually think we saw her in one of Django's cover story chapters actually and she is a Navy captain. I don't know if she is just a minor character, if she'll become important later on but she seems to understand her role, her place in the Navy, and the fact that even though Straw Hats did defeat Crocodile, the government will never recognise that and they do not want the truth to get out. So Smoker, Tashigi, and now Hina, these are all Navy people who I think I want to try and keep an eye on, see how they develop and if they end up changing sides or what have you. But Luffy and the gang are having a well-earned rest. It's finally raining after three years. It's raining and Toto is fine as well. He is in Yuba still and he is like, see son, didn't I tell you it would rain? And his perseverance is so admirable. Freaking love it. There are so many admirable characters in One Piece that my heart just can't take it anymore. It just can't. I have no room left for these characters in my heart because it's just taken up by all of them. <laughs> okay, a couple of things. Did Igaran marry his sister? They bizarrely look too alike for my liking. Like, is he attracted to himself and that's why he married her? Or did she change her look to look like him after they were married? <laughs> there were some like perfy things happening in this as well, especially in the bathhouses when they were asking, oh, where are the girls getting changed and stuff? And then they, they kind of spy on them. But then Nami catches them and she flashes them and says, that's 100,000 berries each. Again, Nami always with the hustle. Always with the hustle, like she... So like a couple of weird things. However, Luffy waking up and well, one, it being quiet and then Luffy wakes up and there's this just a whole ruckus is hilarious. His love of food is just so apparent. And the fact that he wakes up and is like, I've been asleep for three days, I missed 50 meals. And they're like, well, he can't get it that quickly. Luffy really does think with his stomach. And you know what? Some of the best people do. Oh, Mr. Two, I actually love him. I actually love it. The way he's like crying and he's got his like thumb up as well. He's the cutest. I mean, not really the cutest cutest, but like, you know what I mean. Just, oh, you're my friends. Oh. And he was on the side of bad with the Baroque works, but sometimes friendship just transcends those boundaries of whether you're a good guy or a bad guy, you know? And Mr. Two is a friend. He's a friend. <laughs> And he did kind of save the ship from the navies because the navy is surrounding the island. Hina is preparing for battle. Battle with the pirates. We cannot be having any more battles. I'm sorry, but I'm pooped. I need a rest. I need a rest from all of this. I need three days sleep like Luffy. I really do hope that Vivi makes it as well because it seems like she's staying behind and, you know, she's going to fulfill her role as Princess of Alabaster. But she really wants to be a pirate as well. She wants to rejoin her friends. And Nami said, be here by 12, be at this port by 12, and we will welcome you as a fellow pirate. So Vivi obviously has this huge decision on her hands. It's not just that easy as, I'm going to go off with my friends and be a pirate, ha ha ha. But she has a whole kingdom, she's a princess, and becoming a pirate is pretty much frowned upon. Like, what does she do? What does she do? But I mean, she loves her friends so much. She misses them. It's all quiet without them. And I hope to God she makes it. I hope she makes it to the port so that they can go off with Vivi and have the most epic of adventures coming up. And also Karu. I do want Karu to also join too. Like not just Vivi, but Karu. It has to be the both of them, okay? Will the Straw Hats be able to get off Alabasta without fighting the Navy? And I'm so glad I read the cover stories as well because Django is, well, the first time we see him in the main story as part of the Navy. And it would have confused me 
had I not read the cover story. So thank you everyone who mentioned in the comments. Make sure you read the cover stories, they're important. And fortunately, it like, paid off. I see Django as part of the Navy and I wasn't confused. I was like, oh, yeah, I, I, I get this. I understand this. Oh yeah, I thought I was done with feeling emotion, but apparently not. I never would have thought, starting this off, that I would feel something towards Mr. Two. I, ugh, what a, what a bean, right? What a bean. The fact that he becomes decoy for the straw hat so that he can get away from the Navy. And he's saying, like, more importantly, like, I'm Luffy's friend and, or the friend of the Straw Hats. And, like, that declaration was so touching. I, the last thing I thought of was that the Baroque Works agents would be someone I would care for. And I probably should have known that after Vivi turned out to be a person I would root for after she had infiltrated the Baroque Works. And I need to stop caring. I need to. It's taken away my heart. It's taken away my energy. And I don't know what's happened to Missile Sunday slash Nico Robin. I do remember them saying that Luffy pulled out two people from the rubble, so it would have been Nico Robin and the King from his fight with the crocodile, but I haven't seen her since. I don't know where she is. I don't know what she's up to. Vivi is also going to try and get to the ship too, so I think she's decided that she's definitely joining them. I'm so happy. She needs to make it though. There's only three minutes left, and I'm sick of these countdowns. Honestly, they're stressing me out. We had the countdown with the explosion, and now we have the countdown with Vivi and whether or not she will make it to the Straw Hats and join them on their adventure. I can't take any more of this waiting. Like, it's stre so stressful. But I, I'm so glad to say goodbye to this arc in a good way, in a very good way. But this journey has been quite a ride and two chapters to go. Oh no, Vivi, go with them. Please, go with them. Oh. Right, I'm just gonna risk copyright to show you this, but this part gave me chills, absolute chills. Look. Oh. <laughs> I love it so much. Oh, the pose, the X symbol that they put on themselves so that they could be detectable if they ever got impersonated. Ah, oh, Vivi, what are you doing? Go with them. She was so close. She was so close to going with them. Oh, I've, I've gone so cold again. <laughs> it looks like Vivi's decided not to go. She loves her kingdom too much, which is fair enough. Like, I feel like this whole arc has built her up to be somebody who loves her kingdom more than anything in the world and her family but also the fact that she has allowed herself to be part of this team and that's changed her for the better but i want her to go with them so bad <laughs> i love the kind of little flashback at the start as well when igaram and vivi first hear about the baroque works and them infiltrating the kingdom and messing with them so they have a lead that they might try and you know infiltrate themselves leading to this entire adventure that vivi went on i love that little flashback but yeah essentially this chapter was just to tear out my heart again. Oh, I thought we were over this. I thought we were over this. <sighs> Does that mean I have to say goodbye to Vivi? There's still one more chapter. I'm still holding out hope. Maybe she will change her mind. But, oh. Uh... On volume 24 we go on the final chapter of Alabaster. Okay, some happiness. I am so glad that Eyelashes is joining the Duck Squadron and is going to get a happy ending. Eyelashes deserves it. Eyelashes deserves some happiness. Their role in this entire battle was so great that they have been so severely overlooked. If it wasn't for Eyelashes, we probably wouldn't have won. So I love Eyelashes. Glad they're getting their happy ending. Um, The ending of this chapter, though? Oh, hang on, before I talk about that, Smoker and Tashigi are kind of going rogue, I think. I mean, they're together, they're in like regular clothes, although Smoker's shirtless. And they seem pretty happy that Luffy and the Straw Hats have gone and they're going to deal with them another day. I think they're going to go rogue. I do. I think they're going to go rogue. They're going to break off from the Navy. And, well, I feel like they have no choice now after Smoker told them to shove it. But it'll be interesting to see where their story develops and goes. But the biggest thing was the end of the chapter. I mean, one, the Straw Hats you know, crying over Vivi and missing her was so amazing. And I loved how Zora was like, well, why didn't you just kidnap her if he misses so much? And everyone tries to call him names. Luffy says three sword style. And they're like, wait, that's not an insult. Fine, four sword style. And it's just like... <laughs> and then Miss All Sunday slash Nico Robin comes out of the ship and she's like wearing Nami's clothes for one. Had a shower, read a book. And she wants to join them. I'm like, okay, okay. So I, we don't have Vivi and I'm sad about that. But now, Nico Robin wants to join the Straw Hats? For why? 
for why? And she also says something about Luffy having done something to her. It seems like the only thing Luffy has done is save her when everything was falling apart and she was knocked out and all of that, although she saved him too. So they've saved each other. So I feel like they're on an even playing field, but apparently something else happened in the past that I have no idea about. So that's going to be interesting. It'll just be interesting to see them accept Nico Robin into the Straw Hat. I, I don't think she's going to like properly, properly join, right? Uh, I, I, I don't know what to think. <laughs> I don't know what to think about that. I mean, she is so interesting. I do like her as a character. I just don't know how she fits in as a straw hat. Maybe she'll just be like a temporary crew member as she gets to her goals, whatever her goals might be. So yeah, I'm confused, but in a good way, in a good way. Great chapter, loved it. So sad to say goodbye to Vivi. Hopefully it's not the last time we see her. So that's the Alabaster arc done. I cannot believe that. That's the entire Alabaster Saga done as well. I spent the entire November reading the Alabaster Saga and no regrets. No regrets. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was a great saga. And the Alabaster arc itself, I would probably give a 9 out of 10. I think it's a joint favourite of mine, mainly because of so many epic moments that happened. So it brings a joint with Arlong Park, but I don't know if it's better than Arlong Park or not. It was very epic, and I just absolutely loved the battles and how they all just made sense to the story, and each character had their moment to shine and learn from them, and, you know, they just developed so much. It was so exciting, so impactful. The fight with Crocodile, like, hey, was not an easy four. The fight to save Alabasta. Oh, just so many fantastic moments. This, doing this, Oh, like, I think that's my favourite moment in the series so far, honestly. Like, it just, I still have chills from that. I am sad to say goodbye to the Alabasta saga, but I'm very excited to say hello to the Skypea saga. Is it Skypea? I will learn the proper pronunciation before my next videos, of course. But yeah, the minute I've completed two complete sagas of One Piece, now I'm on to the third. I cannot believe that. I just, I'm in awe of myself. I'm in awe of these characters, and I'm in awe of myself. I never thought I would make it this far, and this is a ride I do not want to get off anytime soon. Anytime soon. <laughs> I have more One Piece jumpers and shirts coming, so hopefully they come for the next videos, so you guys can see me just continue to buy One Piece merch on and on and on as these videos go on. But yeah, make sure that you subscribe for more One Piece arc reviews. I will still be doing them arc by arc, and more content in general. I do a lot of bookish videos, and I just really appreciate you guys checking out my One Piece videos, and yeah, without you guys, I probably wouldn't have made it this far. You know, all the support you showed me the previous videos, it's just been so overwhelming. So thank you so, so much. I appreciate it so much. I appreciate you like Vivi appreciates Luffy for saving Alabaster. That's how much I appreciate you. Just to put it into perspective. So yeah, that was the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave this video a like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave all the comments down below. Let me know your thoughts on the Alabaster arc, the Alabaster saga in general. Did you love the saga? Did you hate the saga? Let me know everything. I want to chat to you down below. A huge thank you to my patrons for supporting my channel. If you'd like to join my Patreon or follow me on any social media, then all the links are down in the description box. But yeah, I hope I will see you in the next video. Bye!